on these documents. I'm not sure if we'll get to that or not, but we'll. So turn it over to you. Okay, um, just briefly, the fund structure is just basically a reference. Um, it goes over the different funds that we have, and then it, uh, it itemizes out any departments that are contained within that fund. Um, basically, the special revenue fund is, uh, it contains different departments, like the streets and the highway and the parks. And then any departments which are within those funds, and then the functions that they all serve, and then where they get their revenue from. So I just kind of alternated um, black all the way across and then yellow all the way across so that you can kind of follow along pretty easily. So there are some funds that aren't used currently. Um, the capital projects fund, a lot of those are just closed out funds. So this is just basically serving as a reference point so that you all can see kind of where we get our funds from and what they actually pay for and which departments are supported by those. So that's just a reference. Okay, so the general fund budget, the cover sheet is the revenues that we receive. Most notably, the difference between, oh, I'm sorry, did you have something, Ken? Oh, just a question. Uh, okay. Local taxes is both real estate and income? Correct. Um, and I have a question. In general, we had some carryover funds from last year we should have had, and we've always had some carryover funds. Where are they accounted for? I don't have that right now because of the reconciliation that Clark Schaefer still has. They haven't gotten us okay. that information back yet. Mm -hmm. So any kind of fund balances right now, I just feel like it's a little too premature in order to be able to report on those. Um, so I did not include that in today's presentation. Okay. I was hoping that we would have that for the next presentation, but I'm not sure based upon the feedback I received from the organization, the accountants um, today. So. Lori, look, I'm, I'm going under, to under, undercut Melissa here. I have a report of our bank balances at the end of 2013, mm -hmm. and it is qualified. It is subject to change. Of course. But basically, the general fund balance at the end of the year was $2 million, and the other large ones would be electric, water, sewer, and solid waste. So I won't go into all the other because we've got over 20 funds. The electric fund is showing 1.8 million at the end of the year, but that's, I think there are two cautionary notes. One is there's still a large encumbrance that we don't think, in other words, I think that 1.8 million is gonna be at least four to $500,000 more by the time we close out all the 2013 expenditures and revenues and so on. Um, I've been telling you the electric fund balance is about $3 million, and that's what it was at the beginning of the year. And I don't see any reason it should have been reduced. So, okay. Uh, and I think, I suspect looking at this, that the debt, the paper we bought from ourselves, that 400 and some thousand, came out of that. That's why it's lower now than it was at the beginning of last year. Although we did, according to this, we did um, deficit spend $267,000 in the electric okay. fund. So we would have eaten into the electric fund. Okay. Close to, right. close to $300,000. Okay. And again, this, this note, water fund, 249000 uh, sewer fund, $485,000, solid waste, 67000 Wait, sewer was what? Sorry. Sewer was four eighty five. I'm rounding to the yeah, next no, that's, that's, yeah. I These are just pure ballpark anyway. Okay. And 67000 for solid waste. And again, those are all subject to correction. Just to give you an idea. Yeah, this, according to this, at the end of the year, our total balance is $6,455,000. A couple of specific funds. Um, Marianne mentioned in her note that there was 250000 in the Green Space Fund. Is that uh -huh. approximately correct? Yeah. I got an email, the $100,000 that we committed has not been taken out yet. Krista expects that to come out in April of 2014, mm -hmm. so that will be down $100,000 okay. in 2014. And was there money set aside from the levy for the library and the pool? It seemed to me that there was supposed to be, and that for a while at least Sharon was sort of doing that. I did find on the computer, which was something I wanted to talk with Jason soon about, um, because he had brought up 
to the levy. And I did find a spreadsheet of how some of the levy funds were spent and kind of remaining balances. I'm not sure how accurate that is. Mm -hmm. So I do need to talk with, sit down with Jason and talk with him about it because I did find a document, but I'm not sure how accurate and up to date it is. So right, right. there is something that exists on the computer down there. And, and she was instructed either last year or the year before to take all of those funds and put them back into the general fund. So oh, okay, I couldn't remember yeah. that, and that I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't money out there that wasn't being accounted for, and um, and especially since we did make some commitments um, so to parts in the marks. Yeah, your marks for a while. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the question is, did that happen? Did the monies get just put? Because they weren't official funds, like the way that the. My understanding is the green space fund <coughs> seems to be sort of ordinance based in a way than anything that was going on. She was just sort of bearing it in mind more earmarking than actually putting it into a separate fund that needs a vote to, to move the money, which was what I always understood <coughs> with, the, with the green space. It is, it is a separate it is a separate fund um, mm -hmm. but I believe that that one falls within the general fund mm -hmm. um, at least the general checking account I guess I should okay. say I believe that that's where that money is placed I'm still space. trying to yes uh -huh. still trying to understand like which money is in which bank accounts and such so right but I okay. believe that that's under the general checking account though but it is its own line <coughs> okay that was my main question that I wanted to ask right away thank you so any questions on like the fund structure or anything before we move on to the, to the <coughs> revenues? I was going to point out for Diane, we were talking about how much change, the, how much the change in the state's support of local governments affects us. And this seems like a pretty broad brush approach. But it looks like share, state shared taxes are going to go from 550000 last year to 190000 next year. So that's dropping by... $360,000. 302 of that was um, an estate. Oh, was that what that estate was? Estate tax right? that was received oh, in 2013, okay. so that would yeah. excuse it. Oh, yeah. okay. Right. But we are losing all the estate tax. Um, so yeah. people should leave money to the village in their wills. <laughs> I honestly believe that. I've been well, meaning to write it up. Well, like, give it. <laughs> what is the, I think, I think, you know, if you believe in the village and you think that was wrong for them to take that away, they should put, should put that in your will. So that is the big difference in revenues between 13 and 14 is the 302,000 is the biggest. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about revenues? And there isn't any, the, the estate tax is all done. There isn't any still out there that came in 2013? <coughs> um, we, could, we could get residuals from estates that weren't completely settled prior to the estate tax going away, but it's not anything yeah, that's worth we'll think about it. Yeah. budgeting in because you just don't know. Okay. And it's unlikely that it's anything. Yeah, maybe it's just good to clarify the, uh, the YSCF grant that's our Miller Fellow for yes. Community Access. In case everybody doesn't make that connection. Yeah, that's eleven $1 hundred dollars a quarter, and that is a fairly new grant that we've received. It's mm -hmm. supposed to it was supposed to start in the fall of last year, but um, I'm not really sure how that worked out. But we did I did meet with the um, individuals from YS Community Foundation, and they did bring me a check for eleven $1 hundred dollars for the first quarter. So we were planning on that moving forward. Which once we get into the cables budget, then you'll see that. I updated that to reflect that revenue coming in so that we can expend it. So is there a reason that you're showing, um, and I, it, I, it's not significant enough to make a difference, but just the reduced revenues in 2014 for local taxes, were you seeing a trend in the last half of the year that somehow showed, made you believe that our income and property tax revenues were going to decline? and? And you're talking about the local taxes? Yeah. I got these um, figures all from the 2014 tax budget, so those were already filed with the auditor. Mm -hmm. So that's where I got these. But the city income tax was projected. The actuals, the actuals in 13 were um, 1.3 million, and then in the 2014 budget it was listed at 1.2 million. So okay. that difference was in the tax budget, and I just went ahead and used those figures. 
Okay. So that was the biggest difference. The rest of them were steady. And it's not significant enough to make a difference. So um, hopefully we'll be higher. Yeah. Okay. So any other questions about revenues before we move into the departments? Okay. Um, the departments, what I did was I, I did consolidate each line, um, obviously within personnel, there are more, more line items such as wages, pension, health insurance, life insurance, and so on and so forth. Um, so I've just consolidated those into each of the categories. So if there's a specific category that you have questions about, you can let me know. I try to make any notes out to the side of any significant changes or noteworthy changes that you may want to take a look at. Um, why do you uh, anticipate our legal budget going up as much as you have going up between 2013 and 2014? Um, the actuals with the legal services were 76,000 last year, and then they are budgeted at 82,500 for 2014, and that was a result of Judy and I getting together and talking. So I did meet with all of the departments. Well, I'm looking. Uh, maybe I'm on the wrong page, but I'm looking under council expenditures, contractual services. It's so, yes, uh, advertising is professional. Part of it. Yes, legal part of it. Right. Yes, correct. Right, but that number is go going. We've got management partners. We've got advertising for the village manager. Oh, okay. Village manager. I mean, I don't know. I would assume that that's part of. All I'm, I'm yes. just asking. I'm not. Mm -hmm. And it was it was in line with what the 2013 bottom line budget was for council. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that it's very much higher than what it was. So the actuals versus what was actually budgeted were a little bit different, and we just basically went in line with what was budgeted in 2013. Judy just allocated certain dollar amounts from different line items into others, and that was one of those was the uh, legal services within the contractual services line. Okay. <laughs> we won't know who you are. Okay. <laughs> Any questions with the council budget? Mayor's budget is projected to be a little bit lower. There was a, a bit of an overage in their personnel services, which we talked it over, and it's going to it's going to be a little bit lower next year. So that's the result of it being just slightly lower in the following year in 14. So mayor's budget, there wasn't anything tricky there. Um, nobody has any questions there. We can look at administration, which is a little bit larger budget. There weren't any big changes except for the contractual services. And again, the uh, regional income tax authority is included in there and we pay in a monthly retainer fee to them. And it increased slightly over 2013. I got actual figures from them. Um, and then the legal and professional services are also in that line as well, just like council. So the reader retainer is $45,000 of that. Legal services were $40,000 of that. Professional services were gonna be $50,000, which was in line with the 13 budget. What was legal? 50. Oh, I'm sorry. 40. Legal was 40. Professional services was 50. I'm sorry. And then the, the services, the personnel services, that's strictly the salary increase. Is that? Um, there is also the um, assistant village manager figured into that. The only people that are paid out of the administration line are a portion of the village manager, a portion of the finance director, a portion of the administrative assistant, a portion of the assistant village manager, and I believe that that covers all of us that are paid out of administration. But it's only a portion of everyone's salary. It's shared with the enterprise funds as well. At least the majority of them are. Any questions on administration? Okay. Auditor, that's nothing sneaky there either. It's right in line with the 2013 budget that was approved, so it is a little bit higher than actuals, but I was just trying to be conservative and provide a little bit of a buffer, with, which was in line with what was approved in 2013. And speaking of the auditors, how are you? 
so far so good. Being in. So far so good. Okay. So yeah, I've been able to find everything that they need so far. So that's a good. Good. Thing. <laughs> okay, so that is page two. Moving on to page three, if everyone's okay with that. Rental property. That one is basically comprised of property taxes that we pay. 15,000 of that is property taxes out of the entire budget and the rest of those costs are minimal, mostly electric and natural gas, maintenance of equipment, uh, rents and leases. So that's basically rental properties in a nutshell, more than half of it is the property tax. And that's not property taxes for all of them. It's um, the train station is included in that, and there are a few other properties that are that I'm not aware of off the top of my head to be able to rattle off. We just got all the property taxes in last week. Yeah, Susie sure. copied those for me. I'm going to go through and see what each of them is. We rent farmland, and I'm sure that's taxable, but most of the stuff we have should be tax exempt. But I'm going to check the bills, make sure they aren't taxing us for things that should be exempt. I think that there's 15 of them that we received. Most of them are minimal. There were only two or three that were over $1,000, so they were mostly minimal. That was for the first half of the year. And then we've got library. It is figured in for a $4,000 security alarm for the air handler. There's a an there's an air handler on the roof of the library which contains copper and Jason has been concerned about theft of that copper so he wanted a security alarm installed so that is an increase over the maintenance of equipment from 655 actual cost in 13 to 4,000 for 14 so that's the only jump that occurs within the library and then we have cable TV. There was no, the only difference there was the part-time person was never accurately figured in. And we figured in the same amount, which we are allotted from the YS Community Foundation grant, which is $4,400. So that was included in there to offset that increased expenditure. And then human relations, it is higher than the actual cost, but that was the same budget as the previous year. So we just went ahead and kept that one the same. So if there are no questions on page three, we can move on. Okay, public safety, this one's the big one within the general fund. I'll just go ahead and let you all look that over and then if there are any questions, I have the expanded version in my hand. So did we not, I, I was, I thought that we had budgeted in 2013 well, maybe we did budget and it doesn't matter, that we were going to have two officers on full time. I mean, that there would be two officers on all the time. I am not sure if that I is. mean, even if it wasn't the budget, it didn't happen. I don't think it's happened yet. Yeah, I don't think In practice. Either. Okay. I know that one officer to be hired in 2013, one additional officer, was scheduled in 2013, but they weren't hired in because everybody that they hired were replacing people that were outgoing. So part of this reflects that 2013 position that wasn't hired for in 2013, rolling over to 14. So that could be part of the discrepancy with the actuals versus what is budgeted because there are two full-time officers in there. One is from 13 and one is being proposed in 14. Okay, so so there's so you're basically saying there's one full-time officer that was budgeted for 13 and just was never hired yes and a new one that's being proposed dispatch I mean I know we lost Larry so we lost a dispatcher that's to replace the dispatchers that we've lost is um, there's one replacement in here for Larry and then there are two additional part-time dispatchers and I believe that those were one or two days a week was what it was um, proposed by the chief And then there is an interesting thing with the health insurance um, with the police department, which I think is notable. 
only the full-time officers the full-time officers are paid out of the police pension fund and it's supported in part by the general fund there's a transfer that occurs and the Ohio police and fire which are, are the full-time police officers retirement system is paid out of the Ohio or the police pension fund and the only pension that truly comes out of the police department's budget are for the part-time officers and all of the dispatchers so that's why part of the pension comes out of here and then the police pension fund actually funds the full-time police officers pension yeah we actually have a fraction of a mill that's dedicated to that purpose four tenths of a mill or something police pensions so are there any questions with the police budget There's no plan. I know we bought a new cruiser last year. We're not planning to do because that and that was the capital. It was mostly. I mean, there's probably there's probably a few other things in there, but most of that fifty-two thousand and most of the forty-one from the year before were buying. I think new cruisers for the department. I'm assuming since nothing is listed there. We're not planning. Yeah, and she. I, I had asked him if he had planned on purchasing an additional cruiser in 2014 or a replacement. He indicated that he hadn't planned on that. Okay, good. And the radios were all paid for in 2013. Yes, radios. I believe that that project is closed out. Okay. Okay. Oh, the Mark. Mark. Yes. Yeah. Mark yes. yes. Yeah. <coughs> so are we okay with yeah. the police department? Yeah. Budget? Okay. okay. Planning and zoning, that one's actually um, decreased from the year before just because there was a planning person that is no longer there as uh, we are using um, Green County. So the personnel line is obviously used to reflect that. Um, we do still have some personnel cost in the planning and zoning just because um, the administrative assistant, part of her salary comes out of planning and zoning. It's a very small portion, but it is a portion of her salary comes out of that so that's why there are still personal costs so Kent do you feel as if the 73,000 is adequate would be adequate if we would decide to bring um, bring in house again at the rate I'm going <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> wait what do you mean the, how quickly I'm going ahead to find someone to to employ to do that, perform that function. <clears throat> we only have to pay them for the month of December, we're home, we're home free. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I guess then the question is, is that, because we're also talking about an assistant village manager, and that's right. that's been budgeted. So so the assistant's been spread through all these budgets, right? right. Okay, so, so then that would, that person could potentially be the person who takes on a lot of the planning role. Right. So the planning role could, could there could be a part-time part person or somebody that was more administrative um, so I guess you know having that number there gives us some good cushion I think right. mm -hmm. to handle both all of that okay <coughs> okay yeah thank you and then mediation there's nothing with that so um, the, the bottom line the bottom subtotal before the transfers is there and the second page is the transfers which there is one one change on here, I, I knew that this needed to be updated, but in the sake of time and getting it into the packet, all of the transfers out to other funds, I went through each of these funds and I was looking at the money that was transferred into them. And I knew that the total at the bottom is accurate. That was the money that was transferred out of the general fund. But if you add up everything in 2013, it was about $500,000 higher than that actual total that came out of the general fund. I left it there because I couldn't immediately identify what where that extra money came from if it didn't come from the general fund and that was uh, the bond retirement fund 45,000 of that sh did come from the general fund in order to support uh, the portion of the old debt repayment that rested with the general fund because it was split between the parks electric and the general fund 
and then the rest of that was money that went into the bond retirement fund, fund from the electric fund and from other places. So the true amount that actually flowed from the general fund into the bond retirement fund was $45,606. That bottom total transfers from general fund, that is an accurate number. But I did know that there was part of that money that was transferred that wasn't actually truly from the general fund, and I just couldn't put my finger on it until after it was already submitted for packet. So you're saying the $1.2 million is accurate? That was accurate. Okay. That was the money that was taken from the general fund, but trying to drill into the computer system to figure out, yes, that money was transferred out, but where did it go? It wasn't linear at all, so I had to do quite a bit of digging to try to figure out where it went, where it came from. Okay. And I did include the annual green space allocation, which we talked about um, how much money is actually in that fund right now. So. And I, I had an email from Krista. I think she is going, I advised her it might be good to come to the um, next meeting because we're going to be talking about um, capital. I mean, it's not really capital, but if she could come to the next meeting. Well, it's a review. I mean, I guess the next right. meeting is a review. When do we actually vote on this again? When are we um, scheduled? The third and the first two meetings, or the two meetings in, 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 in March. March. Mm -hmm. okay. So, but I, I wanted her to come. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Next week. So, you know, she'll make the case. Um, she said that there's a couple of things. She was the one that pointed out that we hadn't had, because I was surprised at the 250. And she said it's because we haven't, they haven't asked for the 100,000 yet. Yeah, because I thought that it's no way it's Right, and she I, said that there are a couple of other things that she's going to propose. So she's going to come with a letter what she um, sees in the, in the future um, that TLT is going to be coming to us for. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have that next week. My feeling on that has been that we can always choose, if we've got the money, you know, we can choose to mm -hmm. allocate it even if it's not During in a separate fund. Or, yeah. And especially if we're going to have 150, which it sounds like we're still going to have right. 150 in that fund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the streets, have we gotten a list of what the 393, what, what streets are included in that? Um, that that was something that Marianne had started to talk about is where that number come from. Yeah. And what that does is if we look at the special revenue funds, actually a street fund is on the top. Um, oh, that's in the next. Right. Yeah, it's in the next packet. I'll be able to explain that. So if you want to table that for a minute or if you want to take a look at that. Yeah, we can just, you on. let's just move, wait till okay. I forgot that that was on the next page struck me as I was looking at it here. I was forgetting. Um, the park, is that the same situation? It is. It's the same situation. Basically, there's a transfer that goes from the general fund into the streets and the parks funds to offset the revenue that doesn't cover the expenditure. So it basically zeroes out those funds. It, support, it gives the rest of the funds needed to support the operating costs, both of those departments. Yeah. The, the street fund gets some money from gasoline yeah. taxes and license plate fees yes. and so on and parks gets money from pool attendance fees and that's about it i think yeah i don't we may have some small charges for bryant center use and so on <coughs> neither one of those functions was completely funded by the what little revenue they get mm -hmm. so no, we have to chip in a big chunk yeah, and I think that the state highway fund can only be used on state highways. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then tax, isn't there a gas tax? Or a tax, gas tax? Yeah, we get gasoline and license plate fees. Mm -hmm. And those are split 92.5% between streets and then 7.5% highways, the gasoline and the motor vehicle registrations. Yeah, the registration is called the permissive tax. I used to mm -hmm. say that it was a tax reserve for permissive communities like Yellow Springs. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could get more of it. Any questions about general fund at this point? No, at this point. Okay. Okay. But the bottom line is just with these operating costs and no capital items, we're already almost half a million in the red. Yeah. Which uh, the estate tax, the three hundred thousand dollars that was in thirteen and not in fourteen, is 
part of that. And then, of sure. course, there are personnel, extra personnel that are being figured in as well, which carry a cost to them as well. Well, I mean, my recollection last year, I mean, one thing we did use to get is a little bit more of a projection. And I know that, you know, projections are only as, you know, they're, they're somewhat guesses, but there was red ink. There was out on those projections. I, I think starting in, in 2015, I, I thought it was 2015, it might have been sooner. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. You know, I think we've been, um, we've been eating into, into our reserves. And, and, you know, it concerns me, especially if we're eating into our reserves. Well, we, and we haven't home. been eating into our reserves in the past. We've been building our reserves, right? I mean, that's well, what's happened in the last several years. No, it has. I mean, not based on funds that we still have access to, but because we've had access to the estate taxes and some of these other taxes, we've been actually mostly building building reserves. Um, no. But those ta those things are going away. Do you know where we ended the year? I mean, I'm seeing that we had 3.140 million in revenues and 3.189 million in expenditures yeah, based in 2013. on what I seen just so in the we were deficit month. spending we, we in did deficit 2013. Spend. It was minimal but it, it was it was okay. right about 40,000 correct. I mean it's it's frustrating and you know it's it's amazing how quickly you know things right. are turning around. And Melissa I guess another thing that's not reflected on these years is what happened prior to 2012 with a drop in property and income tax, right? Yes. I mean, that was our first. Okay. You mean before we had the property tax? No, I, I mean, you know, just loss of jobs and, and business prior yeah. to 2012. That we don't see because this only starts with 2012. Yeah, I mean, could give. Started, what, 2008? Yep. I could. I, I still have that in the spreadsheet that's expanded out, so I could provide that when we go over everything else next week, if that would be something that you all are interested in. I'd like to just see that. Seeing more information. Because those years do exist in the spreadsheet. They were just hidden. To right. Because I think that, that impacts how we think about you know economic development mm -hmm. strategies. So. Yeah, it would be good. Okay, that wouldn't, that, necessarily, that wouldn't necessarily have to happen right away, right. but it would be good to have that happen. I mean, I don't know how far back to go. I mean, if we really want to go back to, to make, you know, to some of the things that you're talking about, I mean, we would be wanting to look at, at the Brene plant closure, which I think was 2004, 2005. Um, then look at, you know, what the increased revenues from the property tax, which would have been 2006, 2007. I don't know which tax year was passed in 2006. I don't know which tax year it was first collected. Um, about a year lag. I think it was about I mean, 2007. So I pay my 2013 taxes now. I could put together uh, kind of a chart of revenues and expenditures that, if you'd like that one page kind of revenues and one page expenditures historically what's happened up until now, if that's something that you would be interested in, instead of blowing out this spreadsheet right here. Yeah, that um, was. We yeah. don't need all of this right. okay. detail. How much? Well, how far would you like for it to go back? I think 2004. 2004. 2004. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will get that to you all. Okay. Do we want to look at the special revenue funds at all? Yeah. That's, okay. That sounds like this. Yeah. We can. We got 15 minutes. minutes. Okay. So the big thing is the transfers in, which we already talked about. It's just to offset the cost of the expenditures since the the revenues from the streets and the parks are very minimal. So at the very bottom, you'll see that that's zeroed out in terms of an overage or a deficit. So do you have a, I mean, you said something about having the project list. Do we have a, or is? There were no projects <laughs> figured into this budget. So this, this is just general this is just operating just literally costs. the general running the department. Correct. Correct. Nothing extra figured in. Now, with the streets in the, which line is it? In the contractual services, there is $175,000 in there for paving. And it looks like in 2013. Wait, where is it under contractual services under total 
under street fund expenditures? Correct. Okay. 175k for paving? Paving. And so that's probably Green County or with yes. the Green County contract. And that was also figured in into 2013. There were 170,000 um, mm -hmm. out of that line that were paving as well. And it looks like that just started hitting that budget in 2013. I don't know how it was figured in prior to that, but in 12, that that didn't exist. At least that that line for professional services wasn't as inflated, which I'm assuming that paving was paid for a different way prior to 2013. I don't recall. So where <clears throat> the um, the grant for the sidewalk project we got from um, CDBG is in here. Where would the where would that expenditure be? Is that under contractual services too? Yeah, it would be under contractual services. Is it possible that the 125 under streets under in 2012 was paving in capital? Um, or I would have to go back and look. I'm not sure. Do you know what the 2013-81 was? Was that one of those that we bought? Did we buy a piece of equipment for the streets? Mm -hmm. But we're paying lease payments, I think. Aren't well, we? that's not streets. Oh, no, that's, that's sewer. That's sewer. Oh, oh, sewer. Okay. Right. What was? Do you know what that 81,000 was that we? 81,000 in capital in 2013. Yeah. Public works. It was definitely debt service. For the streets, well, public oh. works debt service for this building. I don't believe so. Well, public works it was seventy nine thousand two hundred and seventy six, and then capital equipment was two thousand six hundred and fifty. I would have to look to see what that was because it's not ringing a bell. If you would, that would be great. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, so streets. Any any other questions on streets? So just so it does it include, like you said, so the two sixty five is is that mostly project stuff then, or is that stuff? Because the two sixty five includes this the, the paving. I guess I'm trying paving. to figure out. I'm trying to figure out. Um, what what beyond street paving does that include? Yeah, the um, there's paving. There's thirteen thousand dollars worth of maintenance of equipment. Um, there's forty thousand dollars budgeted for tree trimming and line clearing. How much, sorry? Forty thousand. There and was a, that in? There was thirty one four ninety one that actually got spent out of that area in twenty thirteen. Why is that in streets and not electric? That's because what Jason. They, they, they trim they trim trees for clearance for plowing. Uh, so this residential street. So it's not just electric. Yeah, it's not no. It's so why is it called line clearing? The street is maybe it should be tree trimming. Yeah, it, the way that the the system is set up, it says tree trimming slash line clearing, which that object oh. could could be used in the electric fund as for, well, I just see, so yeah. that it doesn't get congested. That's fine as long yeah. as as long as. Uh, yeah, I can see how that could be confusing. Mm -hmm. Um, solid waste thirteen thousand five hundred, vehicle maintenance seven thousand. So those are the bulk of those expenses. The expenses <coughs> mostly is the tree trimming and paving. Okay. Just a second. I think there's there's going to be some questions. You want to take them at the end? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. We'll just, just wait. We'll just finish. We'll finish these. Oh, there it is. We'll finish these funds and then we'll take questions. Okay. Moving on to page two. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. State Highway Fund, um, as we were discussing, that is based upon a share of the gasoline and the vehicle registrations. And there was there was a problem with the allocations that occurred within 2013, which is why you see that. Um, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I know that that was in the audit that there was a misappropriation kind of of those revenues. So I'm not sure exactly what happened. I believe that some of that was probably to correct some things that may have happened in 2012 in that line. When, when, the, money, when the money came in instead of a 92 and a half 
seven and a half split, they divided it differently and gave too much to the state and too little to the village. Same pot of money, same the same to the total they? Didn't change. Sorry. What? Who's the they? You said they gave the, the wrong state gave us the money and whoever allocated it for the village. Oh, okay, so our, our, somebody in our finance, somebody in our our finance okay. said instead of keeping 92.5% for the village, they only gave us 75% and 25 to the state, which is not the way it's supposed to happen. So we had to go back and correct We had to take money out of the state highway fund and put it in the city street. Okay. Oh, so okay. That's why it looks like an expenditure, but it was really an internal transfer. Okay. Put them in incorrect allocation. Got it. Okay. So. Um, incorrect allocation. Any other questions with the state highway fund? Okay. Parks and recreation. Again, you see the transfer in to balance the budget. Charges for service, that line is the pool in the concessions. And then the transfers in are the biggest support to the parks funds. And then it lists each department within the Park and Recreation Fund, which includes Parks, Pool, Bryan Center, and Bryan Youth Center. This contractual services um, in the Bryan Center? Custodians an employee, right? Um, correct. So. Yeah, okay. we, need, we need to contract for custodial services. Contractual services includes maintenance of equipment, electric, maintenance of facility. Those are the, the big ones. Maintenance of equipment, 10000 electric, 28000 and maintenance of facility, 13500 7500 for natural gas. Those includes, are all includes utilities. Oh, yeah. utilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Okay. So we pay ourselves? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, water and electric, uh, we meter ourselves, make internal things. <coughs> yeah, the only exception, I think, is street lighting, which we give ourselves as a gift. Probably shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> it's traditional. So why are we, let's see, I wonder what the, oh, the transfers, that was the bright, that's the bond. Payment forty seven the forty seven thousand dollars and yes that was the old bond payment. I was wondering why we're so much less. Okay, that explains it. <coughs> Any question with Parks and Recreation Fund? Okay, Economic Development Fund. That one is just zeroed out. I'd spoken with Kent on that one. Then we have the Green Space Fund, and that is allocated as it has been in the past. I have that revenue or that transfer in reflected there. Obviously, that could change if that's what Council chooses to do. The next one is the Permissive Tax Fund. That one actually comes from the county. There is a permissive tax fund that comes from the state as well, and this one comes from the county. And it is isolated in its or own is it fund. Miami Valley? Yeah. Motor vehicle license? Oh, MVL. Yeah, okay. that's, that's what that stands for. So that one actually comes from the county. The other ones come from the state, and the county auditor, when they send us the check, it is to be isolated into its own fund. So okay. that is why that is separated. We have the Mayor's Court Computer Fund. They put money in, it's an allocation, a percentage, or it's a dollar amount actually from the fines that they receive, goes into that fund. And then they have some hardware and software in which they pay for. This is probably going to change a little bit. Um, I need to, to meet with June about this. She seemed to think that I asked her if we could make this balance because obviously the revenue and the expenditures aren't matching up and she thought that there was quite a bit of money left in that fund. 
for which they could tap into on a yearly basis, and I found that that wasn't an accurate statement, so I do need to meet with June, and this is probably going to change a little bit where their costs will actually be accurately reflected um, from the revenue that they receive. Well, I've got about five minutes. I mean, does anybody have any questions on any of these other funds so we can give a little bit of time to I don't the question? I don't so. The other ones are very straightforward. Um, the only one that might seem a little weird is the furtherance of justice fund. Um, it's too hard to project the revenues that are going to come in because that, that's made from yeah. forfeitures and stuff. And, and such, um, the, the expenditures, though, they have about 87000 left in there. So Kent advised that we budgeted for half of what the what is remaining in the fund for expenditures for them for the year. Okay. But they normally spend what they bring <coughs> in. That's kind of how it works. And that can only, that's very limited on what it can actually be. Yeah, there aren't really any eligible items. And then the police pension fund, we already talked about that earlier. That just goes to right. cover the full time officers. Yep. Do you have questions from citizens? I know Paul. Paul, Paul. come on up. Paul, I have, a, I have two questions on the uh, repaint of the streets. One is uh, whether the Northwood neighborhood is scheduled <laughs> this year for repaving. And I encourage, if, if not, I encourage you to do that. You know, there's some discussion around that, and I have some thoughts on that. And the other is the uh, drainage on the 200 block of North Winter Street, which has been postponed and postponed and postponed for a de decade or more. And I'd like to see that on the budget for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, now, my understanding for the next the next budget meeting, we have a special meeting on on the twenty fourth of um, February, so that'll be next Monday. Um, my understanding we'll we'll start out talking about capital projects, and my understanding is that the supervisors will be in attendance. They will be talking about the projects that they um, have planned or they would like to budget for this year. So that will be a big meeting, and then so we'll, we'll talk about capital, and then the rest of the time that we want to spend, we'll kind of review, maybe have some more information from Melissa, and um, I don't know if we'll have anything else to review um, in any of these funds or not. Um, I'm just going to have minor updates, um, if any. Um, there's only one or two off the top of my head that I can actually think of. So. And we're starting that meeting at six. Right? We're starting that meeting at six, also. Yes. Oh, okay. Has that been, did you advertise that or is it Thursday? It'll come out Thursday. I mean, I guess we can talk about it because whether we do need to start at six, because we probably, the meeting is probably not going to be that long. I mean, does anybody want to spend more time? Marianne and Jerry won't be here again. So it's just going to be the three of us again. Okay. So do we want to yeah. spend, um, well, Marianne was back. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, she, she wasn't. She couldn't change that, it, I mean, I would say I can do it, so it doesn't matter that much, especially for a meeting like this. For me, and we've it's already noticed it. It's staff. I could, it's not Wednesday yet. I'm gonna change it real fast. But right. for staff, is it easier for a little bit earlier, or is it easier for a little later? I mean, I can. I, can, I yeah, I can accommodate either it makes way. No difference. I six is probably fine. Yes, we'll keep it at six then. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, You're Melissa. doing a great gaps job. that we had um, or questions, I'll make sure that I come with those answers as well. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the meeting. We've already uh, called the meeting to order and had our roll call. We just finished our budget session talking about the general fund budget. Um, now we're moving on to announcements. One thing I want to say, please turn off your electronic devices. Um, there are there will be several times during the meeting where people can participate um, but you'll need to be recognized by the chair you'll come up to the microphone state your name and <coughs> comments have three minutes and we will hear from everybody that has a comment to make before people can can make another comment so um, I think any other announcements I know we do have something um, special tonight. I see that Johnny is here and I think he's going to be introduced or yeah, sworn like in or what do we? Uh, I would like to do that. John, would you stand up? 
John Burns is our new superintendent of water and electric distribution. And John's been on the job for a couple of weeks, three weeks, three weeks and he had a real wonderful holiday weekend where he got no break at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your good work. Uh, we've had many frozen water lines and it's been a real challenge trying to get them thawed out. And do you, do you have any idea where we stand? Mm -hmm. well, we got, uh, Why don't you come, can you come up, yeah. John? Yeah, it would be great, thanks. We're on TV, so okay. you know, say hello to TV land, but <laughs> 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 it does help for them. They yeah. can't really hear anything. We have about 400 time. foot of frozen water line on East Fairfield. Uh, as of 1.30 this afternoon, we got that taken care of. And we got one more to do tomorrow on Woodrow. So after tomorrow, hopefully the weather keeps going and we're good to go. Yeah. So. Right. John's crew has been working because the the way we thaw water lines is to uncover two nodes and hook up the leads from an electrical welder sure. to heat them up and thaw them out. But then we need a generator to provide power to the welder. And so right. someone has to be there 24 okay. hours a day to make sure the generator keeps running and is kept fueled and so on. So and, and one of the problems was that we'd get this section thawed out, get back to this section, and this section would refreeze on it. <laughs> so we got it narrowed down to the middle and once we got that done, uh, we got good water flow. Is there anything that can be done to make sure it doesn't happen? The last time it happened was in 1976. Wow. On this particular water line. Put, put three feet of fill over the top. It's, and where the most problem was, was under the railroad trust. Yeah. But I do have a couple ideals, and I've ran by a couple other people, and I'll give Mr. Brooks one and see if we can accommodate that. Yeah. Great. The one he's still working on, there's some question about whether it's the homeowner's responsibility or ours, and since it's uncertain, I've decided we'll figure in favor of the customer and thaw the line out for them. But I told them that they were working on other projects and it would be a long time before we were able to get there because they were just, it was just a single home and the others all involved multiples. And uh, so I said, look, if you can find someone, a plumber or someone else who can thaw the line, we'll be happy to pay for it. So you get water on Saturday instead of <laughs> Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> and he could not find anybody wow. to come line out so I've actually called a couple of contractors in Columbus trying to help him out and they're nine to ten behind wow. so yeah. but we did make contact with him and he's ready for us to be there first thing in the morning yeah so he's been very patient right? that's yeah well I, I, I got a call from Saturday afternoon we won't be monitored pretty well yeah. but John's been very good about keeping him post on uh, where we are and what's happening that's often the most important thing, so thank you for that. And I want to, I saw John Friday night, Valentine's night, down in a hole on Woodrow, so I apologize to his wife. <laughs> We're appreciative. Right. Thank you. And uh, one other quick announcement. Um, I just wanted to give an update on the village manager search. Uh, after one week of uh, advertising the position, we've got 21 applicants, and uh, that will continue until March 7th. So uh, we're feeling really good, or I'm feeling really good about just the interest that's being generated. Diane Chittister and I'm talking tonight because I was one of the houses without water for several days because of the frozen pipe and I really appreciated Johnny and his crew. They worked very long and hard all weekend through bad weather. I think one night he was there till 3 a.m. Yeah. Um, it wasn't pleasant not to have water but it was a lot more pleasant than being out there trying to fix it and they were so dedicated so I appreciated that. Thanks Diane. Bye. Thank you. Thank you guys. And thank yeah. your crews, all the guys that were out. I saw Jason today and, and Kent, so I was able to thank them. Um, and I know that maybe we could get a card or something so we can write a <laughs> little formal thing to have something to put. I know it doesn't mean that much, but it is. I think it's good to. Or maybe go to the or something. Yeah. Yeah. 
pizza. <laughs> <laughs> massive fun that we've just been worried about. Um, <laughs> I have a, a short announcement. Um, the chamber annual meeting is Thursday night at 6 o'clock out at Antioch University Midwest. It is always a nice evening. Um, we've got lots of great door prizes. Um, our speaker is the president of Terry Burns, the president of Green Soaring Hospital, so it should be a lot of fun. Um, Yellow Springs Brewery will have some tastings and uh, distillery, and we'll have some wine so and some great food. So if anybody wants to come, please do. And the police will be out there with their breath alive. <laughs> 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 Any other announcements? Any citizens' announcements? Okay, moving on uh, to the minutes of the uh, February 3rd meeting. Page one. Page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, and page seven. Can I have a motion? So moved. All second. those in, oh, sorry, I guess second. we do need second. Yes. <laughs> all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We were all, who was, somebody was missing. Who was it? It wasn't one of the three of us, I hope. Um, no, nope, we were voting. all there. No, nope. <laughs> <laughs> we were all voted many times, so I know it wasn't one of us. Review of the agenda. Um, we do have one piece of legislation to add resolution 2014-12, um, approving dues for MBRPC for 2014. Um, any other changes to the agenda? Or uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, we got an applicant for the community access panel uh, that was on the table, and so when we get there, I would like to uh, recommend him for the position. Okay. Um, Lori, did you? Um, did you want to everything, that? everything that was uh, that came to us was via agencies and uh, public officials, so I was expecting to go over any of that. Okay. Um, First piece of legislation is Resolution 2014-11, authorizing payment with a then and now certificate for first quarter of 2014. Okay, whereas the finance director has pending invoices, each exceeding $3,000 for services or supplies that were ordered and delivered prior to obtaining certification from the fiscal officer that funds were available, and whereas both Section 5705.41 of the Ohio Revised Code and Village Policy require prior certification of the availability of funds for major purposes, and whereas the ORC provides an exception allowing retroactive certification when the requisite funds are available both at the time purchase commitment was made and when payment is due, known as a then and now certificate. And whereas the finance director states that sufficient unencumbered money is and was available both at the time the purchase was made and at the time payment was due for the obligations obligation listed below Coolidge Wall, $7,227.22. Now, therefore, the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, the Finance Director is hereby authorized and directed to issue a then and now certificate for the obligation listed above and pay it from the appropriate account upon receiving a properly executed then and now certificate. Section 2, this resolution shall be in full force and effect immediately upon passage. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, all those in, oh, any discussion? Comments? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, resolution 2014-12, approving dues for MBRPC for 2014. Oops. I know. I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> whereas the village benefits from the efforts of the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, and whereas it is the village's intent to remain a member of this organization during 2014, now therefore the Council for the Village of Mills Springs, Ohio, will give our results to that session one. The village manager is hereby authorized to direct the village's 2014 membership dues in the amount of $1,604.02 to cover MDRPC membership assessment. The total amount of $1,604.02 shall be paid from account number 101-1001-3108. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. <laughs> you guys <can> <laughs> <laughs> Variety. <laughs> Um, you want to talk a little bit about what the MBRPC yeah. is, as it says, a regional planning um, organization. They um, 
make, um, they receive basically and allocate um, funds from the state and the federal highway um, to do roadway projects. It's primarily about roadways. Um, but in the past uh, four to five years, um, the board, of which I'm a member, um, has encouraged and authorized them to get more involved in planning. And there is an effort um, afoot right now called Going Places um, to um, do some regional planning, recognizing that, that planning and growth is obviously tied to roadway construction and, and vice versa. So there's efforts to tie them together more. Um, and so that, that's really, you know, that's a big change. Other, other planning organizations um, do get more involved than MDRPC has been, but, um, you know, the past couple of years they have. So, um, you know, anytime we get, like the ODOT grant that we had, that we lost, um, was, was being administered through MDRPC. The, um, the Northern Gateway grant was being administered through MBRPC. So we do have occasion to receive grant funding um, through them. Um, they are, um, you know, even though we're a little community, we, um, they, they, they know us, they recognize us, they have a lot of respect for Yellow Springs um, because of our planning philosophies um, and our growth philosophies and, and obviously because of cycling. It's, that's the other thing that I, I guess I need to take. It, it's a, not just about roadways, it's about all, transfer, all forms of transportation. So they, uh, they fund all of the bikeways, um, bike paths, alternative transportation um, plans, pedestrian, they're endorsing and have gone through a whole, a whole complete streets process. They're administering safe routes to schools. So anything to do with, with federal or state highway money, they're gonna, they're gonna touch. So um, it's a great organization. Um, and it, you know, really, I think, I think it's one of those that I think everybody, um, almost everybody in the region is a member of. And just out of curiosity, where does the two cents come from? It's it's a formula. It's okay. a, it's it's a population based formula. Right. So is there? This is just a, a very silly question, but I mean, I assume that I mean, you have to. Uh, I I guess I'm wondering why do we even have an ordinance? Why isn't this just? You know what I mean? Like why do we? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things that I I like think we don't we, have really much of a choice but to be a member of this if we want. This is one of those that I think when you're talking about, we're talking about the calendar at the beginning in, in the retreat, that I think these memberships we should have on this, on one ordinance or one resolution at the beginning of the year where we kind of approve them all. To me, they don't take that much time and it's sometimes kind of helpful to just kind of review what are these things that we're membership right, right well, are they all And you did them? actually not join an organization it was yeah it was green county or it was it was um uh, I know the green business first it was mm -hmm. business first in mm -hmm. montgomery county so it's not always just a done done deal right done. but this one since it's for i'm just yeah, it doesn't really matter i'm just curious kind of it looks John. like there's a couple of people who want questions so. <coughs> uh, john eastman everything you've said about transportation is completely valid <laughs> i want to just uh, inform the community that the rpc is also a critical player in wastewater planning mm -hmm. that the facilities area planning yellow springs is the designated management agency for wastewater planning in the facilities planning area mvrpc is a critical player in ensuring that people who want to do something um, when somebody wants to do something regarding wastewater in the planning area they and they apply to epa epa goes to mvrpc to determine if it's consistent with the facilities plan, um, so MVRPC has a critical role in enforcing what Yellow Springs has done with the facilities planning area. And they love us because we're we took much more leadership in that than any other community. Most other communities did. And another one is air quality. Um, they they because of transportation, they are very involved with air quality. A lot of the funding they get is CMAC is is congestion mitigation. A lot of the money they get is about congestion mitigation and, and air quality. It looks like there's one more question. Okay. Dawn. Dawn. I, I am 
Tom Johnson. I just wanted to announce on Thursday from 4 to 6, uh, there will be a Going Places open house in Xenia. This is the, the Going Places mm -hmm. plan. It's been mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in um, development for the past four or five years now. They're starting phase three, big GIS effort, so I'm totally cued into it. And um, I, I just hope uh, the community can come out and see all of the great planning that, that Karen and the rest of NBRPC has been involved in and uh, putting it forward, creating that, that digital thumbprint that will guide us into the, uh, into the future. Thanks, Thanks. Great. Thanks Thank Dawn. And I, I, sorry I didn't mention it during the announcements. So this week it's the 20th um, in Xenia, as, as Dawn said, the 25th. Yeah. Next week it's at the... Um, in Dayton, downtown Dayton, well, on the on the west side of Dayton, on East Third Street, it's um, they've got their community, their offices there, or uh, they've got a conference center there. It's actually it's a nice space. It's across the street from the um, Wright Brothers Museum. And then there's one in Troy. I don't know when that is. I think that's the 26th, maybe. Yep. So, so they should come to your event and get all fired up, then go to the chambers annual. Meetings. That's right. Yeah, I know, and I won't be. I can't. I can't go to that, so obviously. So, um, okay, um, can we take a vote? Are we ready to take a vote? Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, um, Karen, I, I did not put this on petitions and communications, although here it sits, and I don't know if you folks want to deal with it at all, but letter to President Obama oh, that's right. about the climate action plan. I've got nothing that flags it and I wasn't sure if Kent was going to put it in the yeah, in I, section. But um, have you all had a chance to read yeah. it? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a letter that um, who was at the climate action plan. Um, some folks contacted us, asked, asked us to write a letter to the President supporting his climate action plan. And um, this is the second time it's come through. I suggested to Judy that um, maybe the easiest thing to do would be to just go ahead, put the letter, or put it on letterhead, village letterhead, bring it to a council meeting and see if we would, if we were willing to, to sign it and, and send it out. Um, and that's what's here. Um, yeah, yeah, so do we make a motion yeah, to do yeah. that? Yeah, well I would move that we do uh, approve and forward the letter. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Um, now is the time in the uh, agenda for citizens' concerns about items that are not on the agenda. Uh, as I said before, three minutes. Um, come up to the front um, when you're recognized and state your name. Any comments? Thank you. Um, Special reports. We have two special reports tonight. Uh, first, I see our treasurer, Rachel McKinley, is in the front row and ready to talk about uh, our treasurer's report. Thank you, Karen. Um, and we just read it, so if you just want to kind of hit the highlights, you don't feel don't feel like you have Thanks. to read the whole thing. Uh, I think the biggest. Thing that happened recently was that from the treasurer's perspective um, is that we transferred the funds that were held in Star Ohio to the Star Plus fund, which is also managed by Star Ohio, but um, it's a new and better investment fund for entities such as ours that the, um, the treasurer for oh, the state of Ohio um, offers, and uh, they were really pushing it this summer when I attended the, uh, my uh, continuing education uh, with the state. And um, it has proven to be giving us higher earnings than previously we, we received from the regular Star Ohio Fund. And um, it's still not great, but it's better. Uh, so for example, we earned in December $270 from the monies held there 
versus a monthly interest income in September under the old fund of $28.75. So about 10 times what <laughs> we had been earning. Um, the other thing that uh, I've been involved with is um, the CBE uh, bond initiative talking about uh, what types of <coughs> bonds we might be able to uh, get under uh, underwritten <coughs> and uh, we pretty much I guess settled on a tax increment financing bond if that is something that we would need to move forward with we've at least um, gotten that settled on how we get the financing done um, these bonds provide flexibility and at least at the time when I wrote this, the interest rates were favorable. I think they still are. Uh, they're starting to creep up a little bit, but still compared historically, we're still low interest rates. Um, and I think that we were talking about doing 20 year callable bonds. Um, so I think that's kind of on hold for now until we settle the bigger issues involved with that project. Uh, I've met Melissa and uh, been working with her a little bit on um, where to find things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she and I, I, I'd like, you know, for us to review the fee structure with the uh, bank and, and uh, discuss how we might continue our progress in reducing fees since it is such a low uh, interest rate environment, that's one way to, to get at your better returns is to just reduce fees as much as you can. And we continue on that uh, by offsetting any bank fees uh, with the type of um, accounts that we have at US Bank. We have a half a percent offset um, rather than getting interest bearing accounts because we can't get half a percent interest from those accounts. So it's, we're better off offsetting our fees. And I provided a report that you can see all the monthly details for 2013. And I think that's it. Any questions? Rachel, I wondered if you could just briefly speak to the limits that municipalities have in investing funds that you talked about when we first met. Um, I mean, just so citizens kind of know that... Yeah, I mean, obviously you're investing other people's monies, um, and other people being the taxpayers, um, and there are uh, there are restrictions on what you can and cannot invest in. Um, you know, I think that it's more than just the prudent man rule, which is sort of your general uh, investment ideas, you know, what would a prudent man, woman, do in this situation, we're held with a, a to a little higher, to a definitely a higher standard than that, um, and we really uh, have to consider um, low risk types of investments, and that's why um, municipalities can only invest in certain types of funds, or their um, designated folk like me have to go and take um, the CBE courses every year to kind of help them, guide them if they want to get a little more outside some of the prepackaged stuff that the, the treasurer offers, like the Star Ohio stuff. Um, you can go to other types of investments, but um, these classes, these courses that we take talk about, you know, what you need to do to make sure that you're not putting things at risk, putting the, the taxpayer's money at risk, what percentage, you know, what what types of collateral and all that other stuff that you need to do, you know, we talk about that in those. And you have to have completed these um, classes in order to kind of venture outside the safe harbor of the certain types of investments that without those classes you can still do. 
Um, we haven't really ventured outside of the safe harbor stuff, so you know I don't need to go to those classes, but I do anyway, just because I think it's a good idea to, to see what other people are doing and, and keep abreast of that. Right now, you don't. <laughs> you just don't see much value well, in it going outside. Part of our part of it is you really need to have a good handle on your cash flow. Um, you need to have a good handle on what you see as your future expenditures. Right. And to be honest with you, I haven't felt as though we really, for a variety of reasons, had a good handle on that. And until we know, you know, what our future needs will be, it's it's a little you know we and plus also things. we're a smaller entity so you know if you're a huge city and you say okay I'm gonna take one percent of our assets and do something a little more adventurous with that well that one percent record you know it's a significant amount of money that you could actually work with right. but one percent of ours isn't much mm -hmm. so we're limited in our size and what we can do and we're limited in that, you know, um, when Sharon was the finance director, I always had, she was always very hesitant to um, tie up money that she was afraid, you know, that some rainy day might come and we would need that. Mm -hmm. And But that being said, um, I don't necessarily think I'm not against it per se, but we need to have everybody be comfortable with that, and I, that hasn't happened yet. So are these typically longer term investments? Well, what you do is you ladder, you, you know, you have this laddering where things come due, you know, every three years kind of, you know, so that you're not tying everything up at the same time. Um, and there's all different kinds of things, you know, there's this commercial paper they talk a lot about. Um, and, and these are types of investments that are designed for entities, you know, municipalities or government entities, um, mostly with the finance sector um, through banks and so forth. Um, and in a sense, that's kind of what we're getting with the Star Plus. And uh, what they're doing is they're pooling this money that everybody sends this fund, and then they're spreading it out among a whole bunch of banks, and um, who are, I assume, you know, are issuing some sort of commercial paper. In in that, they are offering a FDIC um, protection and. So there's a, a quite a bit of record keeping that needs to be take, done um, on the fund level because they make sure that none of your money is not, not more than 100 or 200,000 or whatever, 250,000 I think is the FDC, you can't see limit now, I have to keep up with times. And um, so they make sure that we don't have more than that in each bank, but they're doing it behind the scenes. We don't see that. And but what that means is we are FDIC protected for all of our money, which is really excellent. And you can't get that with right. uh, some of these other investments. Um, so this is very secure. Um, and for until such time as we have all of our players up to speed and in place, and by players I mean you know new village manager, Melissa's feeling comfortable and all that stuff, I think it's just going to be where it is for now, mm -hmm. you know? Okay, so. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Sure. Any Thanks a lot. citizen questions for Rachel? Taki? Paul and Taki. Taki Manalakos. I have a question about, uh, about the fund that you were just talking about. So as an economist, it makes an impression to me that during the peak years of the recession, the balance was increasing, uh, which strikes me as a little bit peculiar. But you would think that during the peak years of the recession, that money should be drawn down to account for other revenue deficits. So if you could comment why in 2009, for example, and 2010, that balance has gone up, 
And it's only in 2013 that the average balance is falling. Uh, I think that would be good to know. So that's one question. My other question pertains to uh, what, is, what are the policies governing the specific use of those funds? So to use those funds, uh, what policies can be invoked? Uh, so I think those are my two questions. All right, well, part of what you're asking, I think, is not something that I am privy to a whole lot of that information, because that's more administration uh, as far as um, why our, our balance has increased. Um, did we not have a, a levy not too long ago? I think that 2007, 2007. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't do the. I don't keep track of that type of thing. That's more a finance director, and um, so I would defer to her on that kind of question. I just pretty much handle um, the investment, what we're earning, what our fees are, that kind of thing. So it is um, a rainy day fund, yes. No, this no, is our. It's no, it, it's it's money that is on hand it's it's essentially cash on hand oh. and so if you think about it um our our i mean kent could probably shed a little more light on on the ups and downs of this stuff but um i think that uh average balance or whatever um I just think that there is um there's the invest there is sort of the rainy day fund in here but our annual budget is like a 12 million dollar budget is that mm -hmm. correct yes mm -hmm. and so if you look at this um I think it's basically what we're saying is that we have about half of that in reserve so, you know, is that something that, you know, we want to be more aggressive with and spend that money? Can we afford CBE? All those kinds of things. I think this type of information looks to that. Yeah. So if there is a rainy day fund, as you just said, but in the peak year of the recession, we had a growth in the rainy day fund. Right. Which just means that our spending was down. I mean, right. I mean, that's part of it, too. And the other part is that at that time, we were still getting estate taxes, a pretty, and so that, those were really helping to build our, our, our funds during those years. Right. We were getting fairly significant um, estate tax revenues. Yeah, and the local government fund was still in force. We got a fairly sizable chunk of money from the state that has disappeared. Right. Well, and, I'm and John Kasich's pocket. Obviously, our, our, our balance went down in 2012, was really when it dipped down. Um, but, uh, yeah, as far as the daily in and out stuff, I'm not that, that involved in that. Um, what was your other question? Uh, that was the most Paul Abendroth, I uh, wonder if either of you have looked at other financial institutions in the area for some of the products that you're, you're looking at. You may have better fees or interest rates at other banks. Yeah, and in my written report, I, I mentioned how that is, that is something that um, I think uh, the, it's always worth a look on a continual basis. And we have looked at that before. Um, it does involve, uh, well, we sort of have an ad hoc committee of the finance director, the treasurer, and the village manager. And we looked at that issue uh, along with some others. Um, and again, um, I think that should be done uh, at least once a year to visit that relationship. And it is about time to do that. My understanding is that the recollection is that the last time you did it is when you got when you went to the bank and you got the you weren't going to get any more interest, 
but you got these fees cut. So mm -hmm. actually, we're we're looking pretty balanced as far as the fees versus. Right, the fees came down quite. A bit. Right, so so that you know that was did prove successful. Right, it helps to tell them that you're looking around. <laughs> I, I want to thank Rachel because, in the absence of a finance director, I relied on her for a lot of stuff I would normally have gotten from a finance director, and she did her best to help us out and fill the gaps. And now that Melissa's here, helping her gain experience with our system and filling in some of the history uh, that no, well, nobody else here has. I'm new, Melissa's new. So thank you for, all on thank you. You for your help. Thanks, Thanks. Yeah, Thank Thanks. you. Appreciate it. Um, we have our next report is the uh, Human, Rel Human Relations Commission. I see two members present. They would come forward. Hello, I'm Lena Radowski, and um, I'd like to say hello to everybody out there too, actually. Um, I, I just stepped off as chair of the HRC in 2013. And uh, I'm going to just uh, quickly review um, our annual report uh, for what we did in 2013, go over some highlights. Also, um, then we'll look at the numbers of what we spent last year. And at that point, when we do that, it's actually going to go to Colin, because Colin was our treasurer. And then now Colin is our chair. And for 2014, he's going to actually continue and address the um, goals for 2014. So I'd like to start by um, just uh, letting everyone know just a little bit about the process. You know, you express interest in being on the HRC and then you do a little interview uh, with several of the village um, council members and then you're um, probably accepted as, as, a, uh, as a member, which I was. And so this is a group of people from the community who are volunteers and um, there's a lot of passion, there's a lot of desire to uh, address the needs of the community. But it is volunteers, and um, we're all pretty new at it. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to have done what we did, and I hope we helped in some way. In 2013, we, we really stu uh, stood back and made our emphasis on looking at the history of what HRC has done. Um, we found that there's a lot of um, good things done, a lot of good things done, but a lot of patterns and um, the history kind of just repeated itself on what was being funded. None of them were things we didn't want to fund anymore. It was just we wanted to make sure, are they still a need? Are they still a prevalent need? You know, are we current? So we spent a lot of time in 2013 kind of tidying up. We uh, spent a lot of time looking at um, what are the needs in the community? What are we hearing? What are we seeing? I, uh, I called upon everyone in the, in the group to go out and find, find a need and let's look at it. So we made uh, our goal to be current, to be accountable uh, with the money, and to make sure that whatever we are asked to assist with or we propose we assist with is in line with our mission. And the mission is, the purpose of the Human Relations Commission shall be to promote harmony among the citizens of the village and to work to eliminate prejudice and discrimination within the village against any individual or group because of race, religion, nationality, heritage, gender, age, physical disability, sexual orientation, and economic class. We decided that it was really um, appropriate for us to see the HRC as a prevention um, method and then to look at mediation as uh, more of a response to an issue. So we wanted to focus this year on preventing things as much as we could. And if, we, if in a, in a situation did occur, we wanted to step in, and the question asked would be, how can we prevent this from happening again? What can we do in the future? Within the packet is the annual report, and it's, um, so if you don't have it tonight and you didn't get out there, you can go on the um, village website, and it's in the front of the packet, and go down several pages, and it's this lovely, colorful logo. <laughs> and that's one of the things that we did this year. We looked at process, and so we now have an official logo. That's somewhere in our report. <laughs> What, what I did on this is I just thought I, I just hi, what I'd highlight is um, the names of what we did and then what, what would be our focus group uh, you know, that, that we're targeting uh, for that. So we fund a boys and girls night out at the Yale Springs schools. This is a standard traditional thing that we fund and of course that focuses on youth. 
We assisted in um, with harmony in regards to sexual orientation by uh, funding um, some uh, t the T-shirts of the Pride event. We were uh, we had some great PR with the Hawaii this year with uh, somebody volunteering um, the donation of a, um, a token, paying for the to, so we have a peace sign token in the Hawaii We did PR this year also with getting um, our logos and our T-shirts, which Colin is wearing by the way, and I did not wear mine. <laughs> Uh, in process, then we, uh, we did a lot of form developing. We now have forms that are in the packet. We wanted people, when they wanted to apply for support, we wanted to ask them, are they in line with the mission? What exactly do they need? Are they collaborating? Um, you know, just all those questions. And so we wanted to, you know, how do we decide who we're going to help? So we've got that done. We also now have a form called um, consideration, um, request for consideration, because sometimes it's not money. Sometimes it's just um, there's an issue and they'd like us to intervene in some way. So once again, we want to make sure that it's in line with the mission, talk about what they need from us, and get it in writing. The third form that we um, developed was a follow-up form. We decided we want to know how it went, you know, what can they do differently next year, are they getting help in the future, etc. So we did a lot of processing. Positive Choices is another youth activity. Uh, John Gudgel is very active in getting those things going. The uh, neighborhood block parties, uh, we know we do that every year. They're really fun. This year we had Tony the Juggler, um, and he was quite a hit. I think everyone really enjoyed Tony. We um, have different odds and ends in the paper this year. We had What Makes a Good Neighbor that came from the block parties. That was, uh, we asked people to write down what do you think makes a good neighbor, and then we publish it in the paper. Another thing in process was we, um, in looking at the ordinances, um, we are supposed to serve as a sounding board for issues and advise the council if possible on certain things. So we wrote a formal letter uh, just saying, hey, we're here if you need us. Um, we we uh, funded and supported the Elaine Comedy Film Fest this year more than a month. Uh, so that focuses on race. And then also within that realm, the youth, um, well, the youth facilitators is youth, and that's at the high school that they were involved in that. Uh, there was a great event at the uh, Little Art Theater last year on uh, dis for disabilities called Shooting Beauty. I don't know if you saw it. It was just absolutely amazingly wonderful. We, um, we sponsored that. In regards to race, there was a PBS series called Many Rivers to Cross. We learned um, through the, um, the Black History events that um, there was a need in the community to increase the uh, integration of black history into American history in, in the Elf Springs schools. And so what we did was we wrote a formal letter to encourage that that occurred, and we purchased um, several copies of Many Rivers to Cross and donated them to the Elf Springs Schools, the Antioch School, and the Elf Springs Library. We put a letter in the paper to help the disabled and persons with, that are elderly when it comes to keeping the, the sidewalks clear of snow and ice. And boy, that was a timely thing to put. We got to run that every week. <laughs> Um, and then with the youth this year, we were uh, real happy to help assist with the, the uh, Bulldog Basketball League. One of the things I just want to throw in there is not only just youth, it's also with disabilities. Our mission now is anytime that we assist in anything that we're, it could uh, promote, especially with youth, uh, could promote inclusion, that we're going to do that. We're going we're gonna to call them up to step it up a notch, and if there's some adaptive equipment or anything along that line, we want to uh, make sure they include that. And if they need more money, to come back and ask us for that. The Harmony Rain Barrel Project began in 2013, culminates in 2014. The monies, um, we secured an artist by the name of Sandy Sharp. And she is, uh, we have a barrel. It's in her hands. She is enhancing it artistically. We're going to put it on display. Uh, the first time HRC is going to have a booth at the street fair in June. We're going to sell raffle tickets so that everyone can afford a ticket and chance to win it. And then we're going to ask, give the, that to the winner. And then we're going to use that money along with other monies to have a mental health series in 2014. Then the mental health series is going to be one through the, um, it's an international series and there are people that are uh, trained from up in Logan County that are going to be able to come down and do training and then there's one that uh, President Obama initiated a year ago and that uh, the first one is really getting to know what do you say or do with a neighbor, a friend, um, of your frontline staff um, to help de-escalate, to uh, help give them resources, etc. It's a very relationship oriented thing. And then the second one is more conversations about what can we do in our community to increase our um, services and supports for persons with mental illness. 
So the, the real purpose of the Harmony Rain Barrel is to promote harmony through the visuals of the barrel and then to fund those series. Then the uh, crisis intervention training, I think we all have become familiar with that this year. Um, this last year, um, after the um, very sad incident that occurred with, with, um, with Paul, we, um, everyone was asking, you know, are they trained, are they trained, do they know how to be trained? So we stepped in on that. Um, we, I, I spoke to Logan County Mental Health. I made it clear that uh, through them locally that if they want to go to training near, they're welcome. Then also we uh, wrote a formal letter to uh, the village manager uh, asking him to please uh, include uh, monies in the budget for the police if that is a barrier to getting crisis intervention training. Our, our uh, hopes is that uh, they will all be trained. We know that because it is a week-long training, it takes somebody off the, off the job, it's a challenge to get everybody training. We want to make sure there's plenty of trainings and there's money. So we, that's what we did to help that. Um, then PIP. I uh, talked to uh, village manager, I talked to the uh, finance department, that's kind of on the back burner right now because of turnover and staff, but that was for the people that are um, in for economic class. We know that right now there's not a uh, formal assistance for people during the winter months if they uh, can't pay their heating bill. Um, so there is assistance in some way, but we thought why not just explore PIP. So I did um, have some uh, conversations with them about that. We went to have a thing in the paper at the end of the year about messages of gratitude. Um, however, I talked to the newspaper and Diane said, hey, we like that idea, we're just going to run with it. So they, they went ahead and put an article about the peacemakers in the paper and that's how that, that got started. The, uh, this, that year, too, we had a big turnover. Uh, we, Jerry uh, Sims was our liaison. Brian then came on board as our liaison. We um, then also gained, and then Patty Dallas, who had been with the HRC since like 1901 or something. We just <laughs> laughed. We don't even know oh, how sure long. She, <laughs> 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 she told us she had no idea when she started. <laughs> so anyway, she was, you know, like we hated losing Patty, but she decided it was time to retire. And so she, she stepped off. And then um, a few others, and um, Leslie White, who had been our, se our secretary, had stepped off towards the end of the year. Then we gained uh, Aaron Cole, Nick Cunningham, um, and um, who else we got? Oh, um, Deborah Wilkinson, Deborah Williamson, Corey and, and Corey Johnson. <laughs> so we had a big change like at the end of the year. But the good thing about it is it's like just a whole bunch of wonderful, fresh blood. And um, as you can see, um, the numbers of dollars that we spent uh, weren't that high. And the reason is because we spent a lot of time pro getting process in order and we are in order. We wanted to be frugal uh, and do everything we can to assist in the community with less money, but we, we were really kind of worked for us. This year, we have fresh blood, we have ideas every meeting, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. So it's going to be a different time. Um, I think that's it. We, I, the next couple of pages are just the uh, samples of the forms. And then the next is the Treasurer's Report, and then followed into, by that is the 2014 goals. So, do you have any questions about 2013? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. So, Linda stepped down as president, so you all see what I have to fill in for. <laughs> really tough. Um, so Treasurer's Report, um, I don't know if you all have looked at it. We've had a chance to look at it, so you don't need to go through the okay. numbers in any detail. Okay. Well, um, and we weren't really, I mean, I just want to say truthfully, we weren't exactly sure what our budget was. Um, we had a number, and obviously what we think that number was is on the last page. Um, I'm not going to say what it is. <laughs> but, uh, um, it, because when Jerry Sims was here, he kind of said, you know, it's around here, around there. But we obviously didn't get close to what that amount could have been. Um, and so that's the treasure report. And if you have any questions, call me. So when you're doing things like you're going to be selling the, um, the tickets, the raffle tickets, that money will go to the village treasury, right? You guys will It'll bring that money in to Melissa. Yeah. Um, who we, who I tend to contact, Susie, Susie Young. Okay. Well, I mean, would you prefer? As, it doesn't matter. No, I mean, just as long as it's as right. it's understood that all the checks get written yeah. from the village and okay. and the ex 
and the income mm -hmm. goes back into the village. And, uh, also, considering we were talking about how many donations we both got, we got our Wyasopoli token donated. Yale Springs newspaper tends to sometimes not charge us. So, I mean, a lot of people are liking what we're doing, or at least willing to, to donate. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think even with the uh, uh, YS Youth Basketball, um, the small amount that uh, the village brought forth was basically seed money for other donors to cover all the equipment that was lost. So I thought that was really great. Great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you did a great job. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Linda. Yeah. Are you you're staying? Are you staying on the commission, Linda? Yes. Are you staying? Uh, yes, I'm the secretary. Okay. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Right. Great job. Thanks. Thanks. That's a really good report. Any comments from citizens or any questions to those two folks? Before we move on, okay. Well, that's what's next on the agenda. Is it really? Yes. Oh, no Presentation on scenarios for water sourcing, including timeline. So, that I will turn that over to uh, to our village manager Kent, and I see that uh, John Eastman is here also. So I'm sure that he'll have some things to add too. Uh, we have the last piece all in the place, which was the estimated cost for rehabilitating our current water supply plant. Uh, we're looking at that, and the idea now is we're going to try to present you with data that will help you make a decision about which choice to pursue. And in the course of doing this, we realized that the information from Springfield was outdated because, uh, and I, I don't know how many people in the audience are aware of this, but we had projected our water needs based on some measurements, which we went back and they, they threw up some questionable data. And we went back and checked them, found out there'd been a calibration error, and that instead of 164 million gallons of water a year, we're actually using 120 million gallons of water. So we told the city of Springfield we'd like to buy 164 million gallons from you every year. And, and I went back to them in December before we come to the conclusion we had the calibration error and I asked, do you still want to sell water to the village of Yellow Springs? And the answer was yes. We probably want to change the terms of the agreement. The original proposal was for us to buy for 10 years at a certain upfront capital price and a certain cost per thousand gallons. And they said they would probably want to extend the term that the original proposal was probably too generous on their part. And when I went back and said, oh, by the way, we don't need 164 million gallons, we only need 120 million, they said, ooh, just a minute, we have to look at this. We're gonna go back and see what figures are appropriate for the reduced value. And I have not heard back from them. This has only been in the last couple of weeks. So they're refiguring uh, what the cost would be to use their service. And so without that information, we don't have the complete set of data. So as soon as we get that, then we'll look at that plus rehabilitating the old plant plus building the new plant. Two different options on building a new plant, I suppose. Um, John, do you want to take off from there? I, I, su I would suppose that one of the reasons that they want to extend the term is that I think the cost of the infrastructure, their cost for the infrastructure coming down 68 was much higher than they expected. Yes, um, so th there's several things here to, to build on what Kent said. The, um, the analysis is very sensitive to the total amount of water that's used and the analysis both on the um, on the standpoint of Yellow Springs and on the standpoint of, of Springfield's point of view. So the, there's a capital cost involved, but what ultimately it all has to be put on an equal, equivalent basis, and one of the ways of putting it on an equivalent basis is what's the cost per thousand gallons when you include the capital cost, the operating cost, the purchase of water or not. And I think one of the things to be clear here, when Ken's talking about getting water from Springfield. It's just getting the numbers to get the information on which to make decisions. No decisions have been made. Um, 
that, and the other thing is that the, there's two distinct issues here. One is a choice of what the source of water and how does that play into the economics. A, a, a separate and related choice is, or decision is, what should be the water rates? And the two go together. But when you put in that, and Kent does, did it on annual usage, I do it usually on monthly usage, so we went from, or for daily usage, so we went from 500 gallons a day, 500,000 gallons a day, there was half a million gallons a day, down to 330,000 gallons a day as the average. So that means that the average, when you take the total expenditures and divide it by the number of gallons per day, the cost per thousand gallons goes up. And so there's a, and, and that has to be covered by the rates. So I think part of what we're seeing here is that the very issue of calibration not only affects the, the computations going forward, it's also part of the reason why the water budget is in, in a problem. As past water rates were assuming half a million gallons per day was actually going to get billed because that was what was being produced. And that wasn't true. They're only producing 330,000 and most of that is being billed. We're not having the huge losses we you know, had been thought we were having. Now, when it goes to Springfield, Springfield is, from the standpoint of Springfield, they have to look at how do they recover the cost that they're going to have in the system. And, it's and we've got to make it clear that it's their cost of per supplying, treating, and supplying and treating and providing the water. It does not include their cost for the distribution system. In other words, Yellow Springs it has its own cost for distribution. So we have to add in our cost for distribution on top of what they would charge for theirs. So their cost to supply the water should not include their distribution system costs, or at least not much of it. So that's part of what they've got to figure out. And then we've got to put all of that back in, into place to have an apples to apples comparison. The, so the downside of the 330,000 gallons a day is that they get less revenue, so they may think that they've got to have a higher rate. Mm -hmm. The positive side is we're buying less water, so we have to spend less in buying that water. So th those all go together, and that's why we were not, when I said two weeks ago that I would be able to come in and give you a comparison, I was very overly optimistic of, in that, based on that we were missing this critical piece of information that depends on someone else to, to give that to us. Um, the other thing I'll say is that Ken and I discussed that I prepare a document coming strictly from an engineering and economic standpoint to put side by side each of the alternatives in a comparative fashion and to separate out any issues which are policy issues from those which are engineering and economics so that they're clearly, here's, here's what the economics are, here's what the engineering issues are, and then here's separate from that and distinct from that would be policy issues, which is up to council to make those decisions. But the more that those can be presented clearly with the background information, I think it'll make your job easier, and that's the intention of what I'm working on. Any, any questions? So we, I mean, we obviously, we I know one of the initial things that was going on when we were first looking at the, compar the comparative numbers between Springfield and Yellow Springs water is that we weren't including their distribution. Their, we weren't including our distribution number in the cost. So, so it was looking inordinately like Springfield was a much less expensive option. Well, the, because the, the distribution wasn't included. Well, the report that I did in 2011 that people have been referring to did include distribution costs <coughs> there. It was added on as the last piece. Mm -hmm. um, I think with some of the other numbers we were looking at as we as we were getting more into the in the discussion, it didn't yeah. include those distribution right. numbers. So the distribution costs, fundamentally the distribution costs are independent of the source of water or the treatment of water. Mm -hmm. But they are very important for what should be the, the water rate. Yeah, right, which we are going to be discussing. So, and, and one thing with the water rate is 
because people in Yellow Springs get a combined utility bill, so it's water, sewer, electric, and solid waste all in one bill, the percentage increase that you, whatever you choose as a percentage increase in the water rate is not that percentage increase on the total utility bill. Right. Okay, the percentage increase on the utility bill is vastly lower than the percentage increase in the water rate that you'll have to decide about. So what are we looking at now as, as a schedule for getting some kind of a comparative document? I mean, I'm actually glad with two council members gone, I wouldn't have wanted to have an extensive discussion anyway. Well, the key is when do we get the information, the critical information from Springfield. Um, I'm anticipating that I'll be putting the report together for two weeks, but if, if they're not going to be back in two weeks, they, we will, they should be back. At least Marianne will be. I don't know if Jerry will be. We hope Jerry will be. Yeah. But I mean, that well, would be something that we'll have the data. Will we have the data from the Yeah, but we don't know for sure that we'll have the yeah. data yeah. in time because we got to get the data, we got to get it into the analysis, and we got to get it into your packet. Right. And so that's the constraint there. But I'm, I'm ready to do it as quickly as we can get that information. Okay, well, we'll, we'll hope for two weeks, and if it's not, then a month. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it looks like there might be comments. I have a concern about the financial part of your analysis. And as I understand it, you can correct me, the cost of, of producing water is electricity, little maintenance, and payroll, with payroll being fairly significant in, a, in that cost of producing water. We have, I think, three employees that do the uh, sewer, uh, the water treatment plant <coughs> and the wastewater treatment plant. They run both plants. If we were to shut down our water production plant, would we reduce our those three employees at all? Mm -hmm. Is it fair to include employee cost of producing water locally in comparison to Springfield cost if by going to Springfield we would not reduce our, our budget? I think you have well, to look at the at the okay. So the distribution part of the budget doesn't change depending on the source. So everyone that's in Johnny's department <laughs> is still got to do everything that Johnny's got to do. On the treatment side, the amount um, if if water is purchased from Springfield, there are some treatment tasks that would be ongoing but they're less significant than the, the personnel costs of operating the, the water treatment plant, the wells and water treatment plant. How staff is utilized in divide, you know, between different tasks. So you, in looking at the economics, we've reduced the, the, the budget. In other words, the, 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 I think what you're getting at is the the budget number we're putting into the economic analysis for Yellow Springs staff related to production and treatment goes way down. But that doesn't mean the personnel get laid off because how, the, how personnel are handled is up to the village manager and how they might be reutilized for other tasks or to do things elsewhere. So it's a matter of which budget does it come out of, not number of people. Is that a fair statement? Well, no, I think, I'm Paul, I think Paul's on to something. In other words, we pay, we have three people and technically one to one and a half of those people are running our water plant now. If we no longer produce water, we don't need that one or one and a half people and that reduces the village's cost. So, uh, so if we, if the option is rebuild our plant or build a new plant but stay in the water production business, then our production costs include those wages. If we're buying water from Springfield, then those costs go away, but substituted for those are the cost per thousand gallons that we have to pay Springfield. So it's a trade-off. It may not be equal. With three people, you, you should have two people working together for safety. You yes. would not have any labor cost savings 
by shutting down the plant. Yeah, so we, we have three people still now. have to hire three people. No, if we have three people now and we shut down the water plant, we would probably go to two people. No vacation the wastewater plant. And that's and that's one of the liabilities of working on our scale, is we probably need 1.3 people to run the wastewater plant. But it's hard to find people in three tenths increments. So, <laughs> consider the the real cost. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I would. If we don't, if we no longer produce water, I would expect to have a smaller staff. But not that much smaller. And, yeah, it might, it might not people reduce, might think it might oh, be one third instead of fifty people, but it's, it's <laughs> three. <laughs> but that's or also, two big plants. But that's also because the the three employees run both plants. They work right, at right. both plants. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it, it is it's it's, it's pretty small. Yeah, it's with the very issue small of vacations yeah. and other things like that, then that's where the manager works with the other departments, just as they do now on many things to cover what's needed right. given the staff that's available but there would be less need for people if water was purchased from Springfield yeah. to run the because it would not be running the wells and treatment plant yeah. and that, well, yeah. what we have to compare Paul is right now uh, you were right we pay for wages energy uh, chemicals repair and maintenance of the physical plant those kinds of things out uh, to to pay for the water we get, and I don't know what that cost is. I don't know if I can figure it out. I mean, we've got a budget, and we know how many millions of gallons we produce. It wouldn't be hard to go back and figure out what our cost per thousand gallons is, but I can't tell you what it is off the top of my head. Springfield was saying, if you take that off the table, we'll give you the same thing for $1.64 a thousand gallons or $1.69. Well, the number they had given us previously was $1.86. Was it $1.80? Okay. $1.86. But they, gave us, they gave us a number, so, yeah. yeah. And I think, if I, for some reason, this number sticks in my mind that the, the average cost of all the costs related to, to production and treatment of water, not distribution, is about 230000 a year. That's not chemicals, right. electricity. Historically, it's been about that amount. 30,000 years. So, 230, divide, so divide that by 120 million in your head, and you'll get your cost per thousand. One other thing, John, when you're doing your comparison, um, Ed, are you are we going to have? I, I know there's been some question about what would happen with that property. What would happen if we would purchase water from Springfield? Dollar uh, ninety-one. What would happen to? the well fields and to that property now because it's it's I know we own it but it's Glen property I understood there was some sort of or it's by the Glen I understood there's some sort of reversion clause are we gonna have get that information I'll, have, I'll talk with Ken about seeing what we can put in there I, I do not actually have a copy of the document that has the reversion clause in it so I have to see what it says the other factor is um, and this is a difficult piece of information to get because EPA, it's very difficult to get hypothetical information out of EPA. So there are specific requirements to keep a well, to keep from having to close a well. Mm -hmm. And so we'd have to be sure that we met those requirements and to say, EPA, and the same thing with, if we wanted to quote mothball the treatment plant, uh, I've heard that uh, I, I was not present for the conversation with EPA, but I've heard that EPA said, well, you can't mothball the plant. Well, I'm, I'm not personally convinced that that's the case, but, and again, that's the kind of hypothetical that's very difficult to get an answer on. I think it's clearer to say what would have to be done to keep the wells um, from having to be closed. Right. Uh, but there would be some cost up front, but some cost ongoingly to make sure those wells would stay um, available. And then that may be what would keep the reversion clause from coming into play. Okay, thanks, John. So we're looking at one of the next two meetings um, to having some moving on to the next uh, phase. Sure. I guess uh, I, I wanted to expand your question, Karen. 
in a sense, uh, and since John's here, but I, it wasn't clear to me in the previous version uh, of the estimates if there was some sort of cost estimate that went into whatever action is uh, going to happen with the plant if one chose another path, as you were saying. And it seemed to me the previous representation made was that there was a decommissioning, or there was a, a reversion clause, and, and the question came to mind for me, what's the decommissioning cost for the plant if one hands it back to the other owner uh, who may have a claim to it? So that should be a, a line item, I would say, uh, in the comparison between these two. And it's not going to be zero, I'm sure, of that. that you can't just hand over the keys and say, well, it's good. Uh, but if the village wants to maintain it, there's still going to be considerable maintenance to be done to that plant to keep it operational and within regulations. So I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, is that going to be in the comparison that's, that's coming forward for you guys? Are you requesting that? I guess I would recommend that you do request to have the, uh, the whatever the future disposition of the existing plant is going to be uh, somehow accounted for and represented in the comparison. Let, let me make one thing clear. The reversion clause affects the wells, not the treatment plant. The treatment plant is on ground the village owns. Okay. Clear, pretty clear. Uh, but the wells are in part of the South Glen. So, yeah. And you're right. I mean, uh, I'm guessing, John, that they would want us to cap or seal the wells if we took them out of use, right? Well, if they took them out of use, but then that might be what would cause the reversion clause to kick in. To kick in. So to not have to close the wells, there would be things that would have to be done, like to exercise them a certain amount, to test them periodically, to do the things that would keep them um, in appropriate condition. Okay, okay. okay. great, thanks. Uh, Thank if you. I might, uh, before we move on to this, I know you have other things you want to get to, but uh, the other curious thing, and perhaps, um, Kent, or, or some of you have, have a better picture of this than I do from where I stand, but uh, in, in looking at these comparisons, I, I get a crisper picture of what happens if Yellow Springs continues on in the business of producing water, which is a, a certain sort of investment in some finite bits of equipment and, and processes. Uh, I'm a little bit less clear on what the contractual arrangement would be with Springfield, and I was wondering, has a sample contract been presented uh, that would outline their responsibilities and duties and the sort of uh, relationship that this body would have to the Springfield Water Authority. Have you had an opportunity to examine that? I think I think that there may have been a sample a sample contract. Okay. I mean, it, 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 we haven't even taken it to the point of having our attorneys look at it, which would certainly be something that would happen. So, um, you know, I I I'm not I'm personally not concerned that there would be any inequity or that. Our attorneys would not let us get ourselves into a contract that put ourselves put us at risk. So we're not expending legal fees yet to make that determination, but it will certainly be something that would be an issue. Certainly, be something that we would need to do. Okay. Yeah, there's a draft or an outline, but I have not actually seen. Um, I, I was only thinking to add that at this point because um, I think it was John's comment about or did it come from counsel or John? I'm not remembering, but. Uh, the comparison at this point being on the financial terms, which the contract seems to stand in a relevant relation to that, but is not technically part of the financial. So, okay, yeah. thank you, thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay. Um, so we look forward to continuing that either on March 3rd or the 17th. Um, next on the agenda is council goals. I. Um, didn't intend for there to be much conversation about this. I mean, Marianne and I met um, about a week or so ago, and I just made the decision to bite the bullet and just, I, I liked that this form for at least kind of organizing thoughts. Um, I like the person responsible. I think that's always important to have. Um, <laughs> And then the resources, I put in information that came to my head. I, you know, it's certainly not complete. I basically put down every goal that, that came, that was on the sheets that, that we had. Um, you know, I mean, I'm balancing kind of where you were um, in, in, you know, kind of your thinking, Lori, about, you know, knowing how much we have to take to do this year, how much more can we take on with Mary Ann's feeling of why are we doing goals if we're not going to do them. Um, 
So, you know, I mean, what I'm feeling is that clearly, again, I mean, this is not something we can do with, with three council members and missing two council members, but um, what I'm thinking is that if we can spend more time on some of these things with council members um, taking a stronger role in at least doing some initial due diligence, um, no. that that feels to me like something that um, that might help things go forward a little bit more. So, um, well done. I'm really yeah. it's nice and visible and easy to follow. So I appreciate the work you put into that. So I don't know if Marianne's had a chance to look at it yet, but yeah, um, she did. I saw she, she commented. Great. Okay, new business, um, water rate increase. Um, I'll turn that over to Kent. Water, yeah. Water rates are sort of the mirror side of the water supply question. Um, a year or two ago, someone named Dawn Lund did mm -hmm. a rate study, yeah. and I've asked her uh, how much it would cost and how long it would take to revise it and update it with the plant rehabilitation prospect and figures available and the changes that Springfield might propose. And the answer was it would take her six weeks and cost about $5,000. So I'm not gonna ask her to go ahead yet. I'm gonna hope that we get a quick answer from Springfield and hear from John in two weeks and that might be, then be a decision you might wanna take on as to whether to have her do a, a more thorough study with the rates. The water rates of uh, the village, I believe in 2010, adopted a schedule of rate increases over several years. And there's a 3% rate increase okay. due to take effect uh, already scheduled for April 1st. And my comment to the council in one of my notes was that it really needed to be closer to 25%. So the question is, do you want to consider, because no matter what comes out of the decision about water sourcing, we've got at least, I'd say a million and a half dollars worth of distribution system upgrades that need to be made. And we did get word from the state that the loop completion project grant is, they told us it's, it's official, but don't count on us till we give you a contract July 1st. Sort of a, uh, I don't think it's so. Huh? I don't think it's so much. Don't count on it, as it is. The bureaucracy is such that do not contract well, construction yeah. work or spend money against the grant okay. until until you've signed the contract right. July first. Right. Okay, but but the okay. specific okay. wording was something to the effect. Uh, an agreement will be released on July one. Assuming budget authority is in place. Okay, so, so that's the caveat. Yeah, and the Ohio Public Works Commission has been um, funded by the um, the bonds that the state sells. Right. And I don't think there's ever been a time. So it's a caveat the administrator puts in there. I don't think in, in the right. entire time that they've done these, there's ever been a time when budget authority wasn't there. Right. So. Yes, gets right that there's okay. some small risk, but it's a very small risk. Well, I mean, I think we've already decided we're we're probably not moving forward on on that project this year. I mean, I you know even yeah. I mean that was that was a comment you made that you didn't want to even take it on. Oh, okay. Yeah, you didn't want to think about taking it on. Yeah, right. you were putting it in 2015. I mean, I think it was right. John. Actually, John suggested maybe because we would, we would want have a contract. Had the, we would have had engineering. We would have had to start that yeah. project now. That's well, I think I mean, what I was saying was you can do the engineering in advance. You can even advertise for bids, but you can't let a contract. Yeah. Until you. And that's what I was bid. saying earlier. Is if you if you really wanted to take it on aggressively this spring, you could get that's started right. with the surveying and the engineering. The. It doesn't mean holding off on the design until next year. You can start the design. You know the surveying. In fact, it's sufficiently. To get there's a significant advantage to doing the surveying when the leaves are not on the trees <laughs> so that period between when the snow's off the ground and when the leaves come out is the ideal time to get the surveying in the can 
as they say, then you can complete the design anytime. You wait till the leaves come out, and you can still do the surveying, but it's just that much harder uh, to, to deal with all that vegetation. That's one thing. But the other thing is that once you're ready to do the engineering, once the grant's available, and you start doing the engineering design, then you can, you're ready to bid it whenever you think the conditions are right for bidding the work. And this is the kind of work where much of it can be done in the fall or even in the winter. It doesn't have to be a summer project. Now there's some, some pluses and minuses to that, but my recommendation is always to, to get the design completed as early as, as you can, and then you're ready to do the construction when things look most favorable to do the construction. Just, I mean, do you feel, I, I mean, I'm sensing from Lori at least that, that to even put out an RFP for, for design services. How are you feeling about that? Would you rather us just wait till your successor is in? Yes. Not, so you don't have to worry about it? I'm not sure I could do it, but I'd rather have the go ahead because I, I think it's urgent. I think the distribution oh. system things are absolutely critical for all right uh, i mean there's not a lot of work for council as long I mean, as that's, it's that's not, an rfp i mean, I, mean I, I wasn't worried about our it. work i was really worried about kent if kent mm -hmm. feels like he can do it and can i just didn't want to say yes let's do this on an aggressive schedule when we've got massive turnover coming in our staff and but if kent feels like well he i'm can, not sure but i'd like to give it a try Okay. I'd, like, I'd like permission to go ahead. Absolutely. That's great. Sure. If you're, if, okay. you're, if you're feeling comfortable, I, just, I don't want us to be putting the pressure on you. So let me go back to one more thing about the water rate. Based upon something that John said earlier about the fact that our water rates are, being, are based on erroneous information, I mean, I wonder what would happen to our rates if we simply based, if we simply modified our current rates to the current, to the amount of water we're actually using. I mean, is that what... If, if that's going to gain. I don't. There are two different things. We're trying, we were using a number for planning purposes that we had to give to third parties, whether we're designing a new plant, rehabilitating the old plant, or selling us water from Springfield. And we were looking at the gross number of gallons that we need coming into our system. We always, we always know how much we've sold. And the rates have been based not on what we produced, but what we sold. And, and that was the distinction. We're producing 120 million gallons a year and selling 104 million gallons. So there is some loss, but it's not an unreasonable or a uh, unacceptable level. Okay, it's within what's considered normal parameters. But the rates are based on what we sell, not what we produce. So. Uh, so no, the fact that we had a calibration error and gave some bad information to the city of Springfield doesn't affect the rates. Okay. Okay. Ken, well, I think the one thing with that is I'd have to go back to the Wolpert study when those rates were, I think it was Wolpert that did the yes, your rate was. study, it and was. what they used to project future, right. or was it, do they do it based purely on actual in revenues or were they also basing it on a projection of water usage and i don't know the answer to that question but i think you know answer karen do what if we just use half a million gallons a day and 330 million gallons a day as being a third of a million gallons and if you were to take that ratio and say what would be the rate increase to just take that ratio it would be a 50 percent increase but I don't know that that's well, an accurate way to do it. What, what, do you, what do you recommend that we do for April 1st? I'd say let it, let it take place and let's look at... Uh, let a, what take Just place? the 3%? The 3% increase, it's already scheduled. Well, of course, but yeah. you don't think we should add to that? I'm, I'm not ready to give you a number. Okay. And you'd have to have it. You'd have to have it now because you're talking about. But what if we? Economy. I mean, we know it's going to be. I, I guess what I'm thinking is, I would rather put in 10% now so that we're immediately 10% okay. on top of the 3%, and then we might have an incremental one then in okay. September. But is we're it, in the meantime, we're we actually. Know, we know we're going to need the money in. We know we're going to need the cushion. Money. Wouldn't hurt to build a cushion. Yeah, or less of a deficit. Okay. 
I don't know. That's that's the way I'm feeling right now. So we we're we're kind of in a desperate. If we wait, then we need more of a build up time. Right. Well, I mean, we were originally talking about 25 percent. You know, maybe if we go down to 10 to 15, that'll be a little bit. You know, not quite so much as as in a fell swoop. I mean, you know, we should have. We were given a couple of scenarios by Wolpert four or five sure. years ago we that were much more, more aggressive we than, than more we aggressive. chose, and um, we didn't we didn't pick them. So all right. So okay. you're, are you saying 13? Well, are you let's saying make, let's, I was make, let's make it 15. 15. Make it a 15, make it a 15 yeah. total. That yes. would be that would be fine. Well, you're uh, okay. If you do it as an emergency, then it all right. creates into here and we'll go on. Then that is an ordinance, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. So April one is this one that's going to happen? Well, we have a uh, four people to make that. So don't we need four? That's right. Yeah, we should. I mean, you will. Mary will. Mary will. Mary will. Mary will. Okay. Yeah. Um. So, so Kent, I mean, what what you're proposing then is that we maybe then get a more accurate read on what the rate should be long term? Yes. Okay. And then at that point, I guess we can also talk about, you know, a scenario like transferring from a fund to keep those rates down. Good. Can I mention that? I, yes. I would like you to. Okay. Um, change gear. Well, I won't either. I'll do it later. Uh, I propose to Council that we have some significant capital costs facing us in the water system. The supply issue, it doesn't, whatever choice we make is going to be a million dollars plus, anywhere from a million to five million. We know we have distribution, well, uh, distribution upgrades that are absolutely vital to make. Uh, and in fact, I can tell you, I got a letter just recently from Xylem saying they're very concerned about the distribution. Mm -hmm. issues. So that's part of my what's pushing me to go ahead. Um, so uh, so we have at least a million and a half dollars worth of distribution system costs, another roughly million and a half dollars worth of water source costs, three million dollars in round numbers, and my back of the envelope calculation was that it would cost us about a hundred thousand dollars a year per million dollars we borrow for debt service to borrow three million dollars. So three hundred thousand dollars a year in debt service to generate three million in capital uh, to make the needed improvements. Water rates currently bring in just under six hundred thousand a year. So three hundred thousand on top of that is a fifty percent increase. Mm -hmm. We have a substantial balance in the electric fund. And my argument is that we, as John pointed out, we bill villagers for a package of services, electric, water, sewer, and garbage. And frankly, the fact that we've underbilled for some of those services, billed correctly for others, and overbilled for others, they all come out of the same people's pockets. And there's right. no huge uh, skewing. In other words, people who use a little bit of water, don't use lots of electricity generally and vice versa. Uh, those are all pretty consistent. So I'm suggesting that we consider bar taking money from the electric fund, which has a $3 million balance, and using that to offset some of the rates for the electric fund. Now there's been debate about should it be $1 million, water. excuse me, one, yeah. should it be $1 million or $2 million that gets transferred to the water fund, and that's going to be one of the issues we have to address. Um, well, the other issue I want to address is the fact that for the past two years we've been deficit spending in the electric fund. Uh -huh. So we can't, we're not going to have that money continuing to sit there if we continue. So we've got to figure out what's going on in the electric fund. Okay. Why we're deficit spending in the electric fund. Yeah. Now the good news is, <laughs> uh, we, we, I used to figure that when I, lived, when I worked here before that we sold electricity to our residents for about 15 to 20 percent less than Dayton Power and Light charged their customers. And it's not any secret. I think we are as efficient as they are. I think we provide better service than they do. I think generally our customers get more reliable, higher quality service than DPNL provides for its customers. But 
we don't pay dividends. We don't have stockholders. We don't pay taxes. And we, if we borrow, we borrow tax exempt rates. And there's your 15 to 20 percent difference right there. So it's it's not magic. So I think I always get a little put off when people say government can't do anything right. I think we're doing everything DPNL does at least as well as they do it at no increase in cost. And given our advantages, we actually end up saving people money. Uh, so now the, the trick is, what is that difference now? And I've done some rough calculations, and the gap has shrunk. I think now it's about 12%. And I'm guessing the reason for the difference is that the electric utility industry has been deregulated in Ohio. And I think it has resulted in a slight decrease in rates for the customers of investor-owned utilities like Dayton Power and Light. Uh, so I'm guessing that is probably why the gap has shrunk. But we, we also have some high cost, higher cost contracts. Our hydro contracts, we're paying more for our hydro contracts and probably the solar contract. Um, so our we're paying more for, for the power. I mean, that, that was a decision we made, a choice we made to invest in, in renewable energy at a, higher, at a higher rate. So I am guessing that that's part of what is going into potentially the fact that our rates aren't keeping up. But I've got, I mean, I think we've got to figure out why our electric rates aren't keeping up. Um, well, and part of the issue is that we are, we're, we are encouraging saving electricity and people are doing that. Right. And so we're not getting the revenues that we, which is good, but it means we, <laughs> but we're encouraging you to not, Buy our product, <laughs> right? But but then, but if we're not buying, if they're not buying it, or if they're not using it, we're not buying it either. Um, but there's Except not the money there for the overhead. Trips. It's yeah. right. I mean, you know, we've got so many miles of lines, we've got so much equipment, and we've got so much staff that costs a, an amount of money, no matter how much electricity is purchased. So I mean, I I am you know I was not concerned about the electric fund for a long time. I'm definitely getting concerned about it. Okay. I don't know if we need to get John Courtney involved. I don't know if you know John Courtney. He's John. Um, maybe it's time for John to you know to come in and take a look at our rates um, and see why we were why we're and I think the other thing the other positive thing that and I don't think you mentioned this that um, it is actually easier than we thought to transfer money from one fund to the other. Right. Um, we thought it was kind of a no-no, but we should be able to do that relatively easily. Yeah, just so people understand, it's not done, it's not something council does at their own initiative. We ask the court for permission to make the transfer, and we have to present a case to them for why it makes sense and why it's practical and why it's, why it's legal. Okay, moving on yeah, to... Yes. Christine Roberts, um, what court would that be? That you court of Common, please. Green okay. County. County. Oh, I see. Okay. And then the other thing I wanted to say is, um, at the time that there was an electrical uh, system study done to see if we needed to spend money for a new substation, uh, it was found that that was not a requirement for the village at that time. However, there were some other aspects of the electric system that were identified needing to be upgraded and the last time I uh, last week when I spoke with um, with uh, Roy Eastman he and I both had the impression that those things had not been done so um, maybe we could revisit that and just uh, have a look at I understand you know I think that our our infrastructure needs repair and I think um, this would be the best use of our village funds before we look at expansion of our infrastructure. I would like to say that also as kind of an overarching principle. Thank you. Thank you. Energy Board could get that all um, those uh, those uh, studies and look at them and and see um, and then maybe and just see what we've done and what we have I mean, to do. I you know from a maintenance standpoint, Kelly's been keeping up with the maintenance. I think that I think that's what's interesting is it is that if our capacity is decreasing, which clearly our capacity is decreasing, our usage, we, our usage is decreasing. So we may not need 
the, the work done. I mean, I, that right. work was yeah. about increasing capacity. Yeah, it, and I think, excuse me, I, I believe that work was about increasing efficiency. Yeah, yeah, now you can double check that, but that is my memory, that it was increasing efficiency. Okay. As I said, I it, it's, it's like the loop that you want to put on the, um, the on the water distribution. That, that increases, that is also an expansion, but it increases the efficiency of that area. It's an expansion, but it is, like I say, it's not... Yeah, uh, we, we've talked for years about a third leg out of the substation. Right. But that was going to be. No, it wasn't a third leg. <coughs> okay. It was not a third but leg. Can we just it. please no. turn this over to the energy board because it is getting late and I really want to get moving. Thank you. Okay. Just look at it. Can Can your report, please. Sure. Um, I want to. Well, Johnny's gone. I do want to thank the streets department and the water distribution people for all the work they've done to keep the streets clear and, and so on. They've done a wonderful job and they've lost a lot of their weekends and evenings and time they could have been spending uh, on personal pursuits and family and uh, we're grateful for that. Um, Ryan's talked about the manager search, we've talked about our cost advantage over DPNL. Uh, I've had a recent inquiry about from the people who talked to us earlier about providing an array for solar generation does the village want to look at that again? Uh, well, I, I mean, I don't know that we can because um, Antioch College is doing a solar array and we've okay. been told by our consultant, by John Courtney, that we can only, the village can only handle uh, a megawatt, that uh, we, we don't, we just don't have that much room left okay. um, in our portfolio. Is that mm -hmm. your understanding, Lori? That was, that was what I recollected roughly. I mean, I think we may end up if we if we keep reducing our need, we may need to start talking to AMP about um, getting about out of getting out contract. of some contracts yeah. and seeing if there would be people interested in like our natural gas contract or or something like that. And the last thing was um, the Center for Business and Education. Uh, I have filed a request to subdivide that property. Uh, installing the road effectively divides the property into several parcels, three in fact. And uh, so at the advice of the planning, uh, our planning uh, person, the county planner, uh, that was something I filed last week. And uh, they are circulating our uh, request to the various affected parties for comment and it will be on the agenda and noticed for the March 10th Planning Commission meeting. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so Planning Commission reviews it as a preliminary plan, makes any comments or changes or suggestions. Uh, we come back later, ideally the next month, with a final plan, and they approve it, and then we come to plan to the Village Council. And so, it could be happen, well, it could happen as early as uh, April. Okay. Late April. Okay, and you said for now the plan is that it's subdivided into three lots? Right. Okay. Yeah, just the three that are created by the right. by the road, and that gives us maximum flexibility for any future users to carve out whatever size and shape of property they need. Right. And I think, let me just make, take a quick look. Um, the Verizon Tower. Verizon Tower, yeah. Verizon leased land behind Bryan Center for a cell tower, and I believe they did it two to three years ago. Oh, that. it was a lot longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> well, they've been paying. They've been paying. Eric's once. They've been paying rent on it for a while, <laughs> and now they're actually ready to build the plant, the tower, and their permits have lapsed, and so I'm looking to see whether there's any way we can accelerate that process for them. Okay. It's the auditors here, Re reason for more joy. <laughs> Poor Melissa. Okay. Yeah. And I also wanted to point out that there was the, um, the PD 2013 annual report, the first time one has ever been done. I wanted to thank Tony and the department for putting it together. Um, 
and then there were other um, just kind of monthly um, reports from a couple of the departments. Mm -hmm. Well, Joe Clark? Bates did do an annual. Oh, did, oh yeah, then, you're right. 2000, yeah, for water treatment and wastewater, yep. um, Joe Bates did have. So, so that's two good reports, two 2013 reports from um, our guys, our staff. And Karen mentioned, I, and I'll change the, the uh, agenda to reflect it so that it's actually listed out on the agenda. It, it gives a little more heads up when those annual reports come in from staff. So those are and a lot of work. Yeah, right. yeah that, that would be good. Just, uh, um, just in fact, if they wanted an opportunity to present anything, yeah. that, that opportunity should always be extended to them when they turn in a report. Right. Like yeah, I was just going to say on the police report, um, I thought it was worth noting about the uh, vacation house checks, just in case everybody doesn't know about that, which is something that uh, if you let the police department know that you're going to be on vacation, then they will do routine checks while you're gone. I thought that was really cool. And there's a, a lot more people are taking advantage of that this past year. And I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. The last time I checked, we were the only police department that was still helping people get into their cars when they're locked out. I think virtually every other department has decided it's more of a liability than it's worth, and they'll just tell you to call a locksmith and pay $100. And, uh, yeah. Judy? Oh, clerk camp's coming up. Pretty darn exciting. <laughs> so uh, that's happening in March, and, and, and actually it's Excellent opportunity for a lot of information and some mildly edible food. So, where is this trip this year? <laughs> oh, well, I, I will say this is going to be in Columbus as opposed to North Canton, Ohio. <laughs> so, pretty darn excited about this. The Fall Institute's always in North Canton. I don't, I don't know how they managed to get that gig, but that's where we go in the fall. Leaf season, you know, it's just beautiful there. Um, so, it's two or three days, and um, I threw an agenda online if you want to want to look at it. And that's... Would you mention your, um, that you will be joining the board? Oh, well, they still have to decide if they want me, but yes, oh, okay. I've been asked to do they that. Will. I submitted my stuff, and woohoo. I'll let you know if that fun. happens. <laughs> I'm going to make a vote on some increased marshmallows and possible earlier bedtimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Get around the campfire and sing Clark songs and toast marshmallows. Tell, tell, tell those stories, horror stories about councils. It's really <laughs> funny. Oh, you, <laughs> know, you have nothing well, to say on your story. Then they hate me. They're like, yeah, how come you get a nice council? <laughs> Honestly, that is quite true. <laughs> okay, standing reports. We'll have half of them. Uh, we very briefly met uh, the Planning Commission and um, it was really just uh, informational because we didn't have anything before us, but we are working on membership and who's going to be president. It looks like uh, Matt, will, Matt will do presidency for another mm -hmm. year. And the Planning Commission of Green County was canceled because yes. I was going to go to that mm -hmm. and I didn't even have to go to that. Um, Brian? Uh, yeah, I'll just mention, because uh, I was supposed to go to the Library Commission, but that meeting was also canceled uh, because of the snow. Um, Human Relations Commission, uh, I think we already heard a great report. Um, I do just want to mention that uh, the uh, YS Youth Basketball Program has invited the community to come to their um, sort of awards event. That's going to be on March 1st. Uh, nine to twelve I think uh, but if anybody's interested I'll, I'll post that information um, and uh, there were a lot of people involved in supporting that group I, I really do think it's something when I watched them first of all I was amazed at the diversity of all the kids playing more girls than boys in the younger league actually and lots of diversity and I really kind of felt the harmony thing that, that we've been talking about um, in terms of the, uh, I'll, I'll skip to Public Arts Commission. So we did have our first uh, meeting that is going to be an ongoing uh, meeting. And we got a report back from the National Bronze uh, uh, Sculpture Symposium. Um, the trail that's going to be hopefully installed uh, this summer 
Um, we will be, as a council, getting an MOU about the, uh, the part of the trail that's going to be on Dayton Street um, that's on Village property. The other uh, parts of the trail are not uh, are on private property, so those uh, really won't affect us. Um, but that'll be something we'll be seeing uh, in March. And um, yeah, great group. Everybody's really excited. I think Jason Hamby's going to come next time, and we're going to talk about maybe the skate park. Um, <laughs> So then, uh, uh, community access panel, uh, in our last meeting I had mentioned that uh, we have currently one position that we need to fill and potentially another one coming up. And uh, we did get a couple people interested, only one individual so far who's submitted a resume and a letter of intent um, and who I've also had a chance to interview. Um, and so, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, I would like to uh, recommend that we accept Charles Fairbanks. Uh, he is currently uh, the media professor at Antioch College, um, has an amazing resume, and uh, one of the things that's really great is he's going to be teaching a course uh, this spring on uh, community access channels. And so he's really interested in integrating uh, what's going on at Antioch College with the village. Um, uh, I think we all looked at his background and we're really excited. So um, I'd like to make a motion that we accept him to the panel. Can we just, oh yeah, not a second back. <laughs> <laughs> I think he'll be the first one that we've ever hired who went to Werner Herzog's film school. Road film school. <laughs> 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 Resume, um, yeah. Um, films, uh, education, filmography. Uh, yeah, he's won many, <laughs> many awards, and uh, he's a graduate of Stanford. Um, he's got a BA from Stanford and a MFA from the University. Of and Michigan. I think there's one of his students. And uh, oh. yeah, that's a comment. All right. So, so I'm expecting much kind so. of more dramatic. <laughs> so I would like to say that he's also received a grant like on the past year that only like one person of the whole year gets that grant. I believe this should be in his resume. But it's a grant to make film and like it's a pretty prestigious grant. I can't remember the grant name. Guggenheim? But, Guggenheim? But, yeah, the Guggenheim. Oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. I yeah. 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 right there. Right? Right. And, uh, yeah. Since you came up, why don't you introduce yourself to uh, yeah, that would be great. Well, I'm Miller Le Fellow. I'm uh, Leo Brandon. I'm the Miller Fellow for Public Access. So if he's on the panel, he'll then be, I guess, higher than I don't know. <laughs> but no, he's a great person. Y'all should hire. Him. All right. Thanks, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a very impressive yeah, resume. If you want to come take a look at it, it's it's really. Yeah, a Guggenheim Fellowship for last year. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. <laughs> now, I do want to emphasize um, we are always looking for volunteers for the community access, uh, for community access. Um, and, uh, you know, Paul could speak a lot to that. So there's plenty of for anybody that wants to get involved. Um, but I do also want to mention that, you know, one of the things we want to make sure when we're looking at commission placements is that we do get resumes and letters of intent and get a chance to interview those folks um, so that the fit is really good. So. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Um, I'll just note with Marianne, with the Energy Board, that there were minutes from the meeting in the packet. So um, even though Marianne's not here, um, there are minutes. So, and I already covered both of mine. Um, okay. Future agenda items. So, okay. So we are. Can we have this ordinance? At the, and then we'll do. So we'll do. Go ahead and do two readings. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we don't know about the ordinance regarding Glen Helen. Is that still on hold? I'm not. I'm not highly hopeful. Just because Chris Connor's out of town until Friday hasn't been, I don't know that he's done anything on it. Okay, well, I, we'll just kind of keep it on there. Let, we'll just keep it on there. It's part of a dialogue with the Glen. Uh, I accept the description of the property to Nick Budis. He came back with two pages of uh, specific conditions he'd like to apply to the easement. And I don't think any of them are unreasonable, but I've asked 
Joe Bates, who has to deal with this, to take a look at it and see if he can live with the various terms and conditions they want to add. And uh, I haven't heard back from him, so I need to follow through. Okay. Okay. So on, um, let's stick with the with the regular meetings. On March 3rd, we'll have the first reading of the budget as an emergency. Um, we may have a water system report um, from uh, Kent and, and John. Um, we'll have the second reading and public hearing of the water of the budget on the 17th, and we may, if we don't have the water report on the seventh, on the third, we'll probably have it on the 17th. Um, other other things that we need to put. Um, Judy, are there other annual reports? Paul, are you ready for? Yeah. Cap annual report. Mm -hmm. So let's put that on the third. All right. Okay. Judy, will you help me remember to talk to Sam about the planning commission? Mm -hmm. We should have mentioned that last time. Um, let's see. Uh, a couple other things. So um, we will be closing the village manager search on March 7th, and then uh, we will probably need an executive session. Um, on the 17th, on the 17th okay. to talk about the rankings. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to, if we can sometime in March, put the uh, eGov solution to the website. Um, I did talk to them today and they've given me a revised proposal, which actually everybody, I think Judy will send out to everyone. She hasn't seen it yet, maybe. I did see it. I oh, just, did you? I oh, yeah, because I, I sent it out just like an so, hour before. So you want to Go um, ahead and put it on March 3rd. I mean, if we room. have room, I think the sooner the better. Okay. Um, and then at our last meeting, and Marianne had also mentioned this in her notes about a uh, potential uh, presentation from the Port Authority, um, but that could wait until April. Yeah, I'd rather yeah, wait on that one about that for April. Do you, do you, were you folks uh, serious about potentially inviting John Courtney? Um, I don't know if we need to invite him. I mean, I, I no, maybe she, Kent she could, could okay. open a conversation with him. Okay, right. Yeah, I, I, I've already got a request in for John, and this doesn't have to involve a visit, but we're having some comp, some difficulties administering parts of the code that deal with electric rates, particularly solar installations. And I've asked him to stop and see us the next time he's in this area. And so maybe I'll put two or three things together and make it worth his time. He, he works in Finley. It's two hours mm -hmm. drive. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so that seems like that's enough for March 3rd. Um, just a reminder that we do have a special budget meeting. Um, we'll be talking about capital projects and then just kind of doing a general review when we're done with that. That's next Monday, the 24th, and that will be starting at 6 o'clock. Yeah, so it's right. here, but that's wrong. If that is incorrect, then I... We, Karen, can I get corrected for the noticing? Um, so I'll look for a motion to um, adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you all.